Welcome back to He's a Giant, special Wednesday edition of He's a Giant. I'm your co your host, uh, Monty. No, I'm not Monty. He's my, I'm sorry. I'm, I'm, I'm your tired host, uh, Sal. Exhausted. Uh, you tried doing this with kids. I'm Sal. I'm here with my co-host, Monty. Hold on. Let me take a sip of my Celsius. What's going on, Sal? You feel a little tired? I'm a little wiped out. I have a day job. I have children. Anyway, I'm, I'm Sal. This is Monty. This is my other brother, Daryl. What's going on, folks? It's Wednesday. We got our special edition tonight going over the top 30. Heading into the draft. We got eight more days of this bullshit before draft night. What's going on, Monty? What's going on, man? It's it's getting there, man. Eight days. One week tomorrow. It's crazy. Like It's kind of sneaking up on us, but at the same time, dragging on at the same, all at the same time. Yeah, it's it's been a roller coaster. It's been wild. So uh, I'm ready for this thing to be over. Um, ready to get to draft. We're gonna have. We're probably gonna do an episode right before the draft for you guys, and then um, afterwards we're gonna do. We haven't really figured out how we're gonna do the breakdowns of who the Giants actually took, but we're definitely gonna get into it. Um, we, as you guys know, we are knee deep in this stuff. I'm exhausted by it. Uh, six months plus seven months plus of doing this analysis for these players. So this is the fun part, right? Just narrowing it down, getting to draft day. Um, Tonight's episode, by the way, thank you guys for being here. Um, like and subscribe. And if you guys don't mind, it's a Wednesday, so all of our viewers may not know that we're here. If you don't mind, please spread the word on Twitter. Uh, you know, if you don't, if you guys don't mind, put in the chats, retweet it, get the word out. Let's get this show rolling. But uh, the reason we're doing uh, this episode on the top 30 visits, as many of you probably know, is that these interviews and top 30 visits matter a lot for the Giants, especially under Joe Shane. Um, we have learned over the last couple of draft classes that Joe Shane takes this very seriously, and we often get clues as to who they're really going to end up drafting. Maybe not round one, but you you see names on these top 30 lists. You're like, huh, that's interesting. Um, and those are guys you may see day two, deep day three, even UDFA candidates. So, Monty, what's your take on the whole top 30 thing with Joe Shane? Yeah, man. I mean, it's interesting. Clearly, you know, there's ways to take the top 30 visits in general. Um, there's certainly a way to take it with us, but there's clearly been a little bit of a correlation recently with, you know, who we've taken. I, I meant to go look kind of back on uh, recent years before we went into this, but if memory serves guys like Cordell Flott, guys like Josh Zudu, you know, the top guys, the Evan Neals, the Kayvon Thibodeaux, the Deontay Banks, um, you know, there's been a lot of correlations between, uh, these top 30 visits and who we bring in. So, it's definitely something that um, we've learned to try to keep an eye on more, even more than we have in the past. Yeah. And I think, you know, a lot of these guys are names you guys are going to be familiar with. We're not going to spend a ton of time going over all those guys. We've, we've just reviewed many of them, especially the quarterbacks in depth. But there are definitely some interesting names here that I think are roster filler type guys, even potentially impact players you might get, like some sleepers. There's some interesting names, and I think you're, you get a clue not only who the Giants might be targeting, but what type of player Joe Shane might be targeting. I think that's you, you get a feel for like the the prototype by looking at these, right? When, I think, Monty, you and I noticed when we went through these guys, a lot of these guys had some similar traits, similar play styles, especially like guys in the secondary. Um, that's At least that's what I got from it. Yeah, no, I definitely agree. Um, you know, some guys we've seen in the past too. You know, we've looked at some of these like more physical, smaller, feisty guys. Then you see, we'll go into it, but seeing some of these more size, speed trait guys, you know, even though we lost Wink, you know, some shit changes and other shit stays the same with teams with mm -hmm. kind of the guys we're looking at. So the list we're using, I think the, 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 the list is largely unofficial for people who don't realize there's no like official the Giants have put out. Here's your top 30s. You, you get these names from, various sources, people in the media who put it together. The best list we could find was uh, courtesy of Art Stapleton, who had 22 confirmed, um, a couple more anticipated that were unconfirmed, and then there are a bunch of local visits. Uh, these are usually people who are from the tri-state area whose visits may or may not, but typically do not count against the top 30. So that's where we're drawing our list from. Before we get into it, though, we should tell people what the top 30 is, right? So... Um, we hear about it, but what exactly is the top 30 money for all of our, all of our viewers? Tell them what actually typically is supposed to happen at these visits. 
Yeah. So, I mean, the top 30 visits is just, I mean, essentially it's 30 for 30 visits you get before the draft where you can bring in players and you bring them to the facility, you give them a tour of the facility, you get medicals, you get to talk to these guys, you take them out for dinner, you know, all those things really just an opportunity to get to know these players. There's also, you know, people do these private workouts in addition to these, but, um, you know, largely the top 30 is just, a opportunity for to get to know the player better and the player to kind of get to know the the coaches and everybody else better as well all right with that i think we should probably just jump right into this right yeah i agree um so i'll you know i'll pull it up and you know, i'll say I'll, I'll do odds you do evens and we'll just kind of switch off and go go through these guys um so, sounds good to me so the first one here um Everybody should be aware of who this is. This is Drake May. Um, we brought in Drake May. You know, we've really done a lot of work on all these quarterbacks, and you know, we can go into, into all that. Uh Drake May, 6'4, 223 pounds out of North Carolina. Uh, you know, what else is there really to say about Drake May? He's, you know, somebody that we've talked about plenty. He is one of the top quarterbacks. <laughs> class for for Sal and I he's the number two quarterback in this class and you know a, t a clear tier break above the rest of the guys he's got all the physical tools you look for a quarterback he's been as productive as any quarterbacks in this draft especially if you look back at his 22 2022 season he was one of the most productive players in college football he did regress a little bit this year but I, I know at least for us we can we are not overly worried about it you know I, I think if we had an opportunity where it sounds like maybe, maybe depending on what the Patriots do, there might be a shot. I would, I would go jump in and go all over that opportunity, but you know, we'll see how it plays out. But um, you know, I don't think too much to say that hasn't already been said about Drake May. Not, now we all know what's up with Drake May. He's our wide receiver too, you and me. And uh, there has been a pretty significant slander campaign against Drake May for the last few months. I think the two of us have been kind of resisting it. Not to say there aren't deficiencies. Not to say there aren't things that have be coached up. But like a lot, a lot. Of, I feel like he gets a lot of criticism that not everybody else gets. And a lot of the stuff that makes him great as a prospect are the things that are being criticized. So. Listen, if the Giants have a shot to get Drake May, if we walk away with Drake May on draft night, we're we are celebrating. And in, in in no in no uncertain terms, we are having a party of Drake Mans of the Giants somehow. So I mean that at this point, that's probably our best wish. Um let's go to number two and we'll do this just as quickly. Oh, go ahead. Real quick, before you know, just, we were talking about this before the show, and somebody asked it. So I think it's a good time to do it. Uh friend a friend of ours, Anthony, he he said something that we discussed before the show. I know we wanted to try to get into. So why don't we just get into it real quick is what do we think of, you know, we're going to go over these wide receivers, but it was only the top three guys who are on this list with Marvin Harrison, Jr. Malik neighbors and Robin Dunze. So, um, you know, Sal, what's your thoughts on, on that? Uh, it's, it's definitely an interesting, uh, it's an interesting thing that they didn't bring in any other wide receivers for top 30s. But I will say this, the Giants, you know, the top 30, again, is, is sort of like a private medical evaluation, personal interview, a little bit more information gathering. Um, a lot of this, I think, is very useful for the guys who are going to be on the bottom of this list, who may not have been combine invites or guys who are not at some of the, not necessarily at the, at the, uh, at the all-star games. Um, what I do, do think you can gather from this is that many of the guys who are going to be the day two guys were were guys who were coached in either the Senior Bowl or the Shrine Bowl by, uh, you know, by uh, Shea Tierney at the Senior Bowl who got a look at them at the Shrine Bowl by Mike Kafka. Uh, so I do think there was some exposure to a lot of these guys. Plus, many of them were at the combine, so you get the met, and you know, most of these guys go through their medicals at the combine, so they got medicals at the combine. You got measurements. You got to interview a lot of them. So. Those bits of information are not reflected in the top 30. So just because they weren't in the top 30 list doesn't mean the Giants haven't already had a chance to review them fully. That's kind of how I look at it. It is a little curious, but at the same time, I don't think it precludes them from taking, you know, a day two wide receiver. Yeah, I mean, it's definitely interesting. And, you know, maybe it is telling. Maybe it is something where they're, you know, really looking at landing a wide receiver at the the 
six pick. That's definitely a way you could look at this. I don't know if that's the case or not. But also, you know, they've spent a lot of resources in these top 30 visits on the quarterbacks. That's another way to look at it. I mean, they've brought in every single one of these top quarterbacks. And, you know, we'll go through that, you know, except for uh, Caleb Williams, who turned down any other visits except for Chicago. So, you know, they brought in the top three guys. And I also think another aspect of this is these next tier wide receivers is so large you know, if you had questions about him, I think it would make sense. Like there's rumors about Adani Mitchell. Like maybe there's thoughts be like, hey, let's get let's figure out that. Let's figure out what's going on there. But it's almost hard to identify which wide receiver is going to fall to you because that tier is so like so big. It's hard to kind of like nail that down, I feel like. Well, I will say this with respect to Adani Mitchell, like top 30 visits do help, I think, clarify questions about medical issues and character issues in terms of getting to know a little bit more about the person so any not to say that he has character issues there's a lot of rumors circulating but there have been you know there have been things on film with him taking off plays and stuff like that this whole new story about his you know diabetes and blood sugars and i don't know what to make of all that stuff but but at least on on film there's some issues about the way he just kind of dogs it on several plays and that's not going to fly in the nfl so if you have a guy who has some question marks and you don't give him a top 30 Maybe he's not a guy you're taking all that seriously. I mean, that that that's one way to look at it because you're not doing everything you can to gather information. Are you going to really walk in on draft night and pull the card for that guy um, versus guys you may have less question marks about? It's just it's something curious. So, um, but let's let's keep going because we got thirty guys to get through. So um, yeah, no, some of these guys will be quick. Yeah, so we're going to move quickly through the early ones because they're all guys you know. Number two on the list is you know JJ McCarthy. The quarterback from Michigan, by now you guys know all about him. He's quarterback three for me and Monty. We're definitely higher on him than, than others. But, the but you know, to I think to our credit, we were high on him from the get-go, and everybody else caught up later, even though we caught a lot of crap for our position on him. And, you know, people have very polarizing views on him. But one way or another, he's probably a top-ten prospect in this class. We know all about him, and we're not going to go over his game. But the Giants have spent a lot of time with him, and Peter Schrager today said that they not only had their top 30, but they did a private workout with him. Um, took him out to Ruth Chris Steakhouse on, you know, the night before Easter and had a private workout with him. So he's somebody who I think is a very, very serious contender to be taken by the Giants at six or potentially to be, tr- you know, to be taken earlier if the Giants move up to get him. So these two names are definitely, I think, the top of our list of possible quarterback options for the Giants. Yeah, uh, I think those two are probably, you know, the guys the that are... Yeah, it's really the most likely guys that kind of at least at the six pick that that we might be targeting. So, um, two guys they've spent a lot of time in. They brought them for top thirty visions and brought them both in also for private workouts. So, uh, Mo, definitely. By the way, Momo predicted that they were going to be at Ruth Chris like a month before it happened, and I said when because he, he he has a tweet about it from like March, like they're gonna he's like Daniel Jones is gonna be watching from the outside of Ruth Chris as Dave, as Dave and Shane are feed are eating ribeyes with uh with JJ McCarthy <laughs> and when the story came out I was like Momo knew and Momo was like I know where white people eat dinner so uh, no offense <laughs> to our white viewers no offense to you Monty but Momo knew <laughs> <laughs> so anyway uh, you want to go number three yeah number three again just you know, kind of fly through this here but you know, Marvin Harrison Jr. That I mean, that's a guy you, you got to at least do your due diligence on. I mean, if there is an opportunity that Marvin Harrison Jr. falls to six, I don't think it will happen. But there's been a little Jordan run on. You know, he put a little smoke out there about it, that maybe the Chargers go all maybe the Vikings trade up for four and there's a perfect storm. He's there. Look, if he's there, I Marvin Harrison Jr. was number one on our our big board or he's a giant yep. big board he he is one of the closest things i think you can find to a perfect prospect i mean like when you try to find all the things that marvin harrison does well it's almost everything when you try to find things that he doesn't do well it's almost nothing you're just nitpicking at this point he is yeah. he is a size weight freak he runs routes as well as anybody in this draft he's productive he's got NFL bloodlines, there's there's a lot to love about Marvin Harrison Jr. Um, I don't know if you have anything to add on to that, Seth. We've called him as close to a perfect prospect as you can get, and that hasn't changed. I don't care what the uh, the the sort of the lead up to the draft process, you know, does to like bring him down. I mean, I think you and I were very early on the conversation, like, you know, when we were reviewing guys like neighbors, I think we had the conversation like, would it would it surprise you if Malik Neighbors had a had a better NFL career than Marvin Harrison Jr. And we both were like, no, that wouldn't shock us because that's how that's a testament to how good neighbors is 
Um, that was never an attack on Marvin Harrison Jr. This is a great wide receiver class, and Robo Dunze is right up there too. But but I, I think there's a lot of prospect fatigue when it comes to talking about Marvin Harrison, just kind of the same as Drake May. Like, I think people have been so high on them for so long, people are almost looking for a reason at this time of year to drag these guys down a little bit. Marvin Harrison Jr., pound for pound, is the best player in this draft. Um, I think I'm, I'm pretty strong on that. So, uh, I, you know, great prospect. Nothing else to say. Whatever team gets him is getting a, super, you know, a superstar in the making. I don't know any other way to put it. Yeah, I mean, speaking of Sal, why don't you dive into Malik Neighbors because you kind of talked about him a little bit there. Yeah, so yeah, the, number four, Malik Neighbors, another strong candidate to be taken by the Giants at pick six. Might be the strongest candidate to be taken by the mm-hmm. Giants at pick six, Probably depending on who you're listening to. Best odds, I would assume, in terms of betting on. So Malik Neighbors, mm-hmm. six, you know, six feet tall, 199 pounds, wide receiver from LSU. Uh, he should have won the Bolitnikoff Award this year. I mean, Marvin Harrison Jr. won it, and I still think Marvin is a better prospect. But Malik Neighbors was the better wide receiver in college this year, more productive. He was incredible. He was our wide receiver, two coming into the year. He ends it as wide receiver, two, and probably closed the gap a little bit on Marvin Harrison Jr., mm-hmm. maybe a lot. Uh, Malik Neighbors is your, you know, I hate seeing the comps because they they tend to be lazy, but it, it really is a good comp. He's, he's very much an Odell Beckham junior clone you know coming out of lsu the same style inside outside versatility a little bit bigger doesn't have quite as big as hands but same play style can line up anywhere outstanding route runner extremely explosive great release off the line of scrimmage quickly separates and he is just a demon with the ball in his hand he can win on vertical on vertical routes down the field he can win running crossers horizontal routes he can win on screens he just wins 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 he's he's incredible so he's a he's another guy who's just a superstar you take him you plug him into any offense he's going to make it a lot better um i'm seeing comments about character stuff. So yeah there are definitely questions about the league neighbors i think some of that stuff's overblown um he did have an arrest on his record a year ago at you know at the french quarter he was he was arrested for having a gun without a license um Maybe there's some issues about locker room stuff. I mean, some of that stuff gets overblown. The team will have a chance to sort through it, but without a doubt, he's a strong candidate. And listen, he he's the he's the prototypical modern NFL receiver, and I think he fits the prototype of what the Brian Dable offense calls for to a T. So I wouldn't be shocked if we took Malik Neighbors at six. And it's hard to be upset. Yeah, we want a quarterback, but if you end up with a player like Neighbors at six, it's hard to be upset. Yeah, I mean, I'll say I've been thinking about it a lot. Like, obviously, you and I are both very like like quarterback is our number one focus right now. That's where we want to go. But I think we'll probably end up being a lot less upset over Malik Neighbors and Roma Dunze than some Giants fans will be if we get JJ McCarthy. So at least we have right. that going for us. Right. Um, we just want the, we just want the team to get better. <laughs> These guys make it better. Um, um, you want you want you want to segue to the next guy, or you want to add anything else about Neighbors? Um, the only, the only thing I'll, I'll add before I segue over is, you know, th- this is a guy who we realistically have a really good chance of getting, um, you know, if we don't go this way, we likely will not have a large upgrade in the quarterback room this year. I'll say to the credit of Malik neighbors, if you don't have a great quarterback, especially if it's Daniel Jones, this is a type of guy where you just tell him to get the ball in his hands and you're going to ask him to make the plays for you. Like, yeah. you know, We'll talk about the next guy, and he he might take a little bit more of you know your quarterback having to make plays and get the ball to him. Um, Malik Neighbors, you throw a slant, and much like o- Odell Beckham when he was here, can take He'll that take that thing yeah. to the house. Yep. Yeah. So, um, you know, very very good route runner. Um, very very smooth. Accelerates through his breaks. It's a lot of his route running is how explosive a player he is. He is, as you said, Sal, the modern day wide receiver. You know, something we said from the very beginning, I was a take I had. I was like, I see Malik Neighbors being the best wide receiver in the last two draft classes we had. And I think it's pretty clear that he is there. I, I like him more than I like Garrett Wilson when he was coming out. I like him more than I like Jackson Smith, Jigba, Jordan Addison. Um, I think Malik Neighbors is a special, special prospect. But he's not alone in this. Um, although Marvin Harrison Jr. is our number one, there is a 2A, 2B after that of two guys who uh, – Roma Dunze who I also think could have been the the number one wide receiver last year or the year before. And I will say I've been mentally battling. Like if we don't go quarterback, would I prefer Malik neighbors or would I prefer Roma doing say, I'll say, I do think people are, you know, overblowing and overthinking some of these character concerns with Malik neighbors. With that said, if it's a two a and a two B, 
I would say character concerns is a decent tiebreaker because Roma Dunze is like everything we're hearing is like as good of a character like as you get. Like people loved him at Washington. You got like that that combine stuff with him just staying after after everybody left trying to get the three cone time like mm-hmm. He's a hard worker. His teammates love him. And and one thing I've been thinking about recently with him is that look, we 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 just said it. Like Malik Neighbor is the prototype. That's what the guys you're seeing that's coming out that are kind of blowing up the league with the you know the Odell Beckham Juniors, the DJ Moores, the Garrett Wilsons. You, you know, I go on and on about that prototype, but I'll say the, the prototype like Roma Dunze, that are players that are this good is getting rarer and rarer. And part of me is like, if you're going to do it, I almost would rather just like, look, <coughs> if we take a guy like Roma Dunze, you don't, you, you don't have to look for that, like big X wide receiver anymore. You don't have to like try to reach on a guy to fit that prototype. Like you, you just got it. And those smaller, quicker guys are just, they're easier to come by in today's league. So I'm starting to go the other way. Um, Matt Harmon, uh, of reception perception also started to lead me that way. You know, he dropped route tree. Yeah. yeah, he dropped that route tree. He's the first person in reception perception history to get green on every single route. And then he comped him to Devonte Adams, who is a guy who year in and year out gets green on every single one of those routes. One of those bigger wide receivers who is a route specialist and, and that's my favorite comp that I've heard for Roma Dunze since it. I've heard Larry Fitzgerald, and I you know I don't dislike any of those comps, but that's been my favorite one. Um, I'm a big fan of Roma Dunze, um, and I think if we don't go quarterback, that's my preference. But um, what are your thoughts? It's close. Uh, you can't go wrong with either one. Um, I'm definitely. I think the Giants will probably go Roma Dunze here over my late neighbors uh, for the reasons you mentioned. I think that the character stuff. I don't know what the character stuff is, man. Like I, 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 I hate to get into that stuff because I don't know the details. Um, but the other way to look at it is that Dunze is a team captain, highly respected. Mm-hmm. You know, he's he's like another one of these guys who comes out of that you know that that system where he's viewed as like a coach on the field. And these, these are guys that coaches value, you know, and they, they they tend to say, I want that guy on my team. I want that leader on my team. Uh, outstanding route tree, great hands. His issue coming into the year was that he didn't have the best contested catch rate numbers. And this year he blew up and had like over 70 something percent contested catches. He clearly made it a point of emphasis. Great hands, uh, separates fairly well for a guy his size, explosive downfield ability. Uh, really, really guard, hard to, 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 you know, defend against because he, he can beat you with size. He can beat you with speed. He can beat you with route running suddenness, uh, not as sudden as Malik neighbors, but you know, like really high up there. I mean, I think he's probably your, he's other, I would say he's probably your, your safest bet outside of Harrison for being like a long-term, mm-hmm. you know, solid number one wide receiver in the NFL with, you know, top five to 10 potential, you know, really he's that good. So if they're just looking for like a super high floor, you know, guy who they think can, can slide in comfortably into that top 10 NFL role, Roma Dunze might be that guy, you know, like just put him in there. He's your ex and that's that. Um, but like you mentioned, you need a quarterback with some stones on him to throw him the ball. He had mm-hmm. that Washington. He had he had the best passer of the football in college and, in, in, you know, and at at, uh, at Washington in terms of like the, the guy in Michael Penix Jr. who understood leverage and understood matchups down the field and was willing to put the ball up uh, and and really place the ball fairly well for a guy like Adunze to go get it, put it, you know, put it on the back shoulder, put it ahead of DBs. As soon as he stacked, the ball was coming his way. If Daniel Jones is the quarterback, the ball is never going his way because he won't be open. <laughs> you know, yeah. there'll be no separation because guys like that don't get open or separation. They're draped, they're they're bracketed. You have to just put the ball up in their area. They're open by design. It, whenever they're on the field, they're open. You got to put the ball up for them. So. I'm assuming we're going to have, you know, a real quarterback by the time we use Roma Dunze. Uh, but yeah. you, but you, you plug him with Daniel Jones, is it's probably not going to be a very pretty sight. Yeah, like, I'll just add to it, like, look, like, Roma Dunze will get himself open just as well as, like, a guy like Malik Neighbors will. He, he's, he separates very well, but the difference is you look at a guy like 
Malik Neighbors, and his superpower is that you can throw a slant and he can take it to the house. He's explosive and make you miss after the catch. Roma Dunze's superpower is that you can throw it up to him and he's the best contested catch guy in this class. They both are great route runners and separate well and all that stuff, but, you know, Roma Dunze's superpower requires a, a quarterback that's willing, willing to throw it up to him well. Malik Neighbors is just a offense that – you know, gives him a chance to get the ball in his hands. And it's a little bit easier to work with while you, while you don't have a quarterback. So there's definitely an argument for both. Absolutely. All right, let's keep cooking. We're, we got to get through 25 more guys. We'll go to yeah. number six here. Uh, Dallas Turner, edge rusher, Alabama, six, almost 6'3", six, 247 pounds. Um, you know, Giants put some time looking at these edge rushers. Dallas Turner is probably the highest upside edge rusher in this class in terms of traits, athleticism, explosiveness. If you watch any Alabama football, which you, which you will notice, I don't know if Goon is in here, but Dallas Turner plays like a sociopath, which I love. Hmm. He he really seems to be he he really wants to hurt people on a play by play basis, and every every time he sees Jaden Daniels, he wants to crack him in half, and he really does. He's he's hurt Jaden Daniels on a couple of different plays over the years. Or Jackson Dart, he doesn't like Jackson Dart. He doesn't like Jackson Dart. Doesn't <laughs> like Jason Daniels. I don't think he likes a lot of people. He plays like he really wants to kill people. I love that about him. He's still not a fully refined edge rusher. He you know he's a great pass rusher. I think you know there are some parts of his game that need to get better. He, he needs to be a better finisher in the pass rush and i think he needs to be a little bit more contained in the run game but he's young and he's got tremendous upside i think he's going to be the first edge rusher off the board uh, that's my guess you know i don't think he's yeah. the most refined or the best edge rusher right now but i think long-term career projection he's probably edge one in this class so you know will the giants take an edge rusher here i mean they just traded for brian burns probably not unless somebody's moved in a deal you know who knows but um I wouldn't think so. Do you have any thoughts on him? You know, it's an interesting guy to bring in for a visit. Um, you know, you, we can think of why they did it. Um, maybe they're just linking like they're like they might trade down. They're making that as a real possibility if, you know, things don't work out for them at the top of the board with the quarterback. Um, I'm not sure. But, you know, I so what you said, I like Dallas Turner. Um, he's a high upside guy. I don't love Dallas Turner, though. I don't necessarily see him any higher than i see latu or verse i think i see them all in kind of the same tier and and but he does have the you know the highest upside but i agree with you i think he's the first edge off the board and i think it's the falcons um you know they might trade back but even then they still might get him uh you know raheem moser not raheem moser raheem morris uses um a lot of a lot of their his edge players in coverage a lot and that's what Dallas Turner does better than all these guys. He's a guy you can put him out to space. He can he can play off ball linebacker. He can play on coverage. And he can also you know rush rush the quarterback and try to break him in half. He's got a little jump can to his to his game. So uh, I like Dallas Turner. Um, I hope he doesn't end up in the NFC East. Yep. Let's go to number seven. And before we do, just very quickly, Peter asks, what's your comp to Roma Dunze? Uh, we mentioned Devontae Adams. Another one that's been mentioned is Larry Fitzgerald by uh, Dan Jeremiah. So just to give you an idea of how good he is. But let's go to seven. All right. Number seven is uh, Joe Alt. Uh, Joe, Joe Alt. I mean, Sal and I differ a little bit on our top offensive tackle on the board. He has Olaf Pachano. I do still have uh, Joe Alt. Um, six, eight in five eighths 321 pounds he is guy is is a monster he is uh you know the prototypical like not like monster offensive lineman obviously you know when you're that tall that does come with some issues and i can see some of the concerns there there's some you know bending issues there's some balance issues but overall i i think he brings the best blend of pass blocking and run blocking in this class um you know, I as far as the Giants go, I would not want to go this route. I I would much rather try to see what we have in Evan Neal. Try to and more than that, just see proof that we can develop some young offensive linemen before we just keep drafting them with no precedent of developing a single one of them. So um, I probably wouldn't would not go this way, especially with the other players at the top of the board. Um, you trade down, maybe we can we can have that conversation. But I think he's going to end up in Tennessee. I think he's going to go to uh, Bill Callahan, and Bill Callahan is going to 
make this man an all pro. I think he's going to make sure that all his kind of like smaller issues that could become an issue don't become an issue and allow his, you know, a guy who was, didn't play like offensive line until like halfway through high school um, really you know, become a athlete and one of the best offensive linemen in the NFL. Uh, do you have anything to add on Joel? I know you're a, lo- no. you're a little bit lower. Yeah, my only concern is Joe Alter, really, uh, the Evan Neal things, like you mentioned. I mean, he's very he's very tall. There's some leverage issues there. I've seen him on tape lose balance against these, these smaller leverage guys. You know, it is a concern. But, like, so I would be worried about him on the Giants. Give him to, you know, Bill Callahan. He'll be fine. Um, all yeah. pro. So I think that's what's going to happen over there. Um, let's go to number eight. This is where it starts getting interesting. So now we're going to start hearing some names that you guys may not be totally familiar with, which is where the top 30s get super interesting because now you're going to learn about guys the Giants may be targeting on day three or guys who they may be looking at as UDFA. So the first one we're going to go over is Tyrese Knight, linebacker from UTEP. He's six feet tall, 233 pounds. He's a sixth-year senior from Lakeland, Florida. Uh, Monty and I were discussing before the, the show, but – what really it pops out there, you know, as you guys know who watch our show, when we did, when we do a prospect analysis, we try to find whatever we t- take we can on them, watch it, and then we we look at their data. And I will say that there are some eye popping numbers in his data. Now, he is an older prospect, but uh, one of the best things that translates data wise for middle linebackers or inside linebackers to the NFL is tackles. This guy racked up 117 total tackles this year with only a 9.9% miss rate. Career miss rate is under 10%, which is really outstanding for a linebacker. Uh, So the data there is really good. Lots of tackles for a loss, uh, 75 stops this year. That's an insane number, by the way, 75 stops. Um, You know, one force fumble, uh, really solid. When you watch his tape, Monty, this guy is, he's a really good football player. He's kind of the linebacker that that I've told you I like, right? He's instinctive. Doesn't pop as like the greatest athlete in the world, but if you watch him as an inside linebacker, he's very, very disciplined, follows the eyes of the quarterback and the running back, and he just follows the play. And as soon as he diagnoses it, which he does fairly quickly, he just, boom, he closes, Mm -hmm. he he finds a crease and takes out the, the ball carrier. Right. And that's what you want from your linebackers who are there for run support. Just follow the quarterback's eyes. He's great against RPOs. Like I watched him against, for whatever reason, or he played against teams that had a lot of RPOs. He diagnosed the play well, whether it was a quarterback or the running back hitting the ball. And then whether it was a direct inside run and a clear lane to the to the ball carrier, or he went around the tackle, he figured out the most efficient route to get to the ball carrier and get a stop. And it was consistent over and over and over again. He's a really smart middle linebacker or an inside linebacker, however you want to use him. So I can see what the Giants see in this guy. A lot of production, really good instincts on the film. Um, you get this guy late day three, he might end up, I mean, he has starting linebacker potential based on that tape. Now it's at a smaller school, but he, some of his best production came against like, you know, big 10 schools and power five schools. So I was very impressed. What, what were your thoughts on him? Yeah, man. He, what popped is he's a good athlete. He's really explosive. I mean, you look at his numbers from the combine. Uh, four, we ran a four six three, thirty four and a half inch vertical jump, um, nine eleven broad jump. You know, uh, seven twenty five three cone. Like all really solid numbers. But honestly, as solid as those are, he plays faster than that. And I think part of it is just he's one of those linebackers who, who kind of plays with his hair on fire. You know, I, I agree. I do see an distinctive linebacker, but I do see a guy who, um, you know, he he kind of does – he there isn't like – I'm trying to use comparison. Like a Jer- Jeremiah Trotter, for example, that's a guy who has a lot of instincts and plays the game mm-hmm. kind of carefully and diagnoses things and is always in the right place at the right time. Tr- right. Tyrese Knight kind of has good instincts for that first read. And he hits as fast as he could. And if he makes a mistake, he sometimes will. But he's going to make that mistake going 100 miles per hour. He's not going to make that mistake like, you know, like half half assing it. Like he is going even when he, you know, doesn't necessarily make the right read, he's going to blow a guy up. And, you know, what I love about him is just how how hard he plays. And, you know, I saw a few plays of him where. And there was one there was a goal line stand and he came in hundred miles per hour and absolutely flattens the guy at the one yard line. There's another one. He was in coverage and the guy gets is about to catch the ball and he 
flattens them and flies out. Like he he's a missile out there. Um, yeah. you know, you I, you no, go ahead. No, no, I mean that's exactly what I noticed. Like once he makes the diagnosis, he just triggers and he flies to the belt ball carrier. I love that about him. Yeah, and you know, you mentioned his his tackling. You know, he had 140 tackles this year, 15 and a half tackles for a loss, but he also was number one in the FPS in solo tackles. I believe it was 84. So yeah. this is yeah. a guy who, who um is strong hands to make the tackle on his own. Um, you know, he's a decent coverage linebacker. I don't I don't think he um didn't see a lot of it, you know. Didn't see a lot on the yeah. tape, but I, but I I don't know how much how athletic he is to do those things. Mm-hmm. Um, we do have Bobby Okereke, who who is sort of that supreme athlete playing linebacker, so it does help, right? It allows you to get more of these specialists who may not be perfect, but you may get value on day three who can really just take away the run game, and that's how I look at him. Yeah. Yeah, overall, he, I just love his like intensity. That's you know, that's the type of guy that you want on a defense. You want dogs. If you want dogs, you want Tyrese Knight. So um, yep. I'm a fan of his. Awesome. Let's go to nine. All right, keep it moving. Chris, Christian Boyd. Um, you know, there's been some talks of, talk about him. I know Giants fans. I know we we are a little bit scared of guys come out of uh, UNI after our Ellerson Smith pick mm. a few years ago. But um, Christian Boyd is an interesting prospect, man. Um, six two and three eighths, three hundred and twenty nine pounds. Uh, he's a big dude. But it's funny when you watch his tape, man. He can one gap the hell out of an offensive line, which you would not expect out of a guy with his size. You expect him to be more of, you know, you, you're look at, you look at the screen right here is a 302 reps in the a gap, 310 reps in the B gap. With his size, you guy who just eats, eats double teams and holds his ground. And he does do that. He, he's, he's a very strong guy, but he's a guy who surprisingly can beat an offensive lineman to, to a gap and kind of, and, and, and make a rush on him. Um, he doesn't have a lot of moves from what I noticed. He kind of just has this, he has a pop with his hands where he can really, uh, has strong hands to push these guys back. And he kind of has this quickness. I mean, he, he ran, let's see, do we have it? I don't even know if we have a, a 40 time on here from him, but, uh, he you no, know, he is a guy that looks athletic on tape, and he uh he definitely is somebody who's interested me. He has a sixteen point four percent pass rush win rate this year, which is insane. I know obviously you gotta take that in the grain of salt given his his level of competition, but uh Christian Boyd is somebody who I w- I would not mind. Um he's not necessarily a replacement for Leonard Williams, but you know, maybe like a replacement for Robinson, a guy who can play kind of that three that three tech who uh, gives you some run stopping and pass rush flexibility. What were your thoughts on Christian Boy? You have anything to add to that? Uh, I like his play. He's more explosive and more athletic than you would expect for a dude his size. I'll say that um, he won a lot on bull rush. He also was able to one gap, like you said, against certain against certain uh, teams. What I will say about that, though, is he has pretty small arms for a guy his size, and and that shows up on film where he he wins bull rushes like he's pushing the sled, if you notice, right? Like he just gets his arms inside guys, and he uses his lower body strength to just drive them backwards. When he gets into situations where, like, there's a sort of an arm length battle, he loses um, yeah. because his arm length, you know, he's going to get he's gonna get bullied on arm length by some interior lineman in the NFL, interior offensive lineman. Uh, so, you know, he's going to have to find other ways to be quicker and one gap more. I think he's going to have to evolve more into a one gapper in the NFL because I really, I, I don't know if that bull rush is going to work in the NFL because I think linemen are going to get their hands up on him and they're going to push him backwards. Um, but he's strong. I mean, 38 reps on the bench, you know, um, that's kind of insane. So uh, curious, I wouldn't touch him before the sixth round personally. I know you and I were arguing over this, like where would you mm-hmm. take him? I personally wouldn't touch him before the sixth. To me, he's the kind of guy like Monty and I were, were, were debating, where would you take him? Was if you view him as an Ashawn Robinson type guy, which I think is a fair, you know, role, you want to get him late fifth, sixth, something like that. Maybe if the Giants trade down somewhere, get an extra day three pick in that territory, um, I would consider him. But I'm not going into the class 
thinking this is my target. Like he's in like that latter group of interior D linemen in like a batch with guys like Keith Randolph uh, or Miles Murphy from North Carolina. I think he's in that territory where you're kind of comfortable with any of them. If you miss on him, whatever. But listen, if he's your guy and it's late in the draft and you say, I, I like this guy, I'm okay with it. Obviously they like him enough to give him a top 30. That's just how I look at him. Yeah, no, I, I definitely hear you. Um, you know, and Brewler gave him a six round grade. So that's probably, you know, we have two picks there. It's probably the most likely spot. But, you know, if, you know, I could see the upside in the fifth if I did it this way. Um, I just want to show this because uh, this one made me laugh. Comment from Will here. Uh, if we held colleges responsible for dra- bad draft picks, we never would have gotten Cam Brown. <laughs> <laughs> Beautiful. Two, two step slander. I enjoy it. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. Take, we, we should send take, Cam Brown signed somewhere, right? Just have the Dolphins sit here or something. He signed, right? the, he signed with the Dolphins. And I, uh, I have a couple of friends who are Dolphins fans. My friend texted me. He's like, he's like uh, what, do you, what do you think of Cam Brown? I'm like, he doesn't play defense at all and he's like maybe an average special teamer so like enjoy <laughs> should have should have gone to philadelphia with the other guy all right uh <laughs> anyway uh number 10 um let's keep let's let's start chugging here we're already how do we get to 40 minutes what the hell do we do <laughs> <laughs> all right number 10 shout smith wade cornerback out of washington state uh just under a shade under five foot ten 184 pounds um I got to tell you, man, I was I didn't think I would really like this guy as that you and I were talking that I and you were like, no, I think he's better than that. I went back and watched this film after I came home a little bit more. And you know what? I kind of like this guy. Um, mm-hmm. So here's what I like about Shao Smith Wade. I think he's a decent fit for the type of system that we believe Shane Bowen was, is going to run. I don't think he's very good in like run with you from press coverage, like with his back to the quarterback. I don't. I, I saw him make some mistakes in that situation, but in a lot of plays where he seemed to excel was playing off man or in zone, where mm-hmm. his where, where he has his you know what they say the ass to the sideline, you know back to the sideline, eyes on the quarterback and following the receiver and just like really kind of being aggressive uh, at the catch point. I enjoyed his game and appreciated how aggressive he was at the catch point. He has very active hands, really active. Like that seems to be a technique thing with him over and over again, where the ball comes his way. He, he diagnoses plays well. He's explosive to the catch point and uses his hands to break up a lot of passes. So I think he has decent ball skills there. I don't think he had a lot of interceptions. Um, I don't think he had any actually. Zero. Yeah. Whole, yeah, uh, and whole three, three, yeah, just this year. three in three years. So not a ton, but he had a lot of pass deflections. Um, and he's the kind of guy like as a CB2 on the outside, uh, I like that kind of play where he's just very disruptive. Will that translate? I don't know. Uh, but he is a very good tackler. Something I noticed, like he's a very he's very reliable in run support, comes in like kind of like a missile, boom, just blows people up. I like that about him. I like DBs who can tackle. I like DBs who are willing to support in the run game. So, you know, I find myself liking him, honestly. Like, I don't think he's anything spectacular, but I think he could be a starting CB2, and he has the potential to be, like, a very reliable type player in that role. You're probably not going to have to give up much draft capital for him. I think he's kind of graded out as, like, a fourth to fifth round player somewhere in that territory. So I, I liked him. What did you think? Yeah, I mean, he I, Burglar actually has him a six round. So we'll say um, okay. I – I liked him enough. He he was a solid right. player. Um, he, nothing about his game necessarily popped to me as high end. There's some he did a few things well enough that I liked. Um, you know, my worries are is that he actually did look pretty fast to me on tape, and that's something I thought he used well at the college level. But a guy who you know only ran four five four, a guy who's you know, five nine and is exclusively played on the outside. That stuff worries me about him translating to the NFL. He's like, he's only played, you only had six reps in the slot. And like I could see him being a better fit, maybe there, just given his like size size issues and his speed issues. I don't know how well he translates, but I did think he was a solid college player. I just don't know how I feel about him as a prospect. That's fair. That's but I, fair. I think and I think everything you said is fair. Um, definitely not like don't dislike him. I don't dislike anything about him. I just question his him translating to the NFL. Yeah, I, I think that's fair to say. Um, I can see a guy who upside is a st- starting CB two on the outside with some with some versatility to the slot. Uh, downside is the way he plays football. 
good backup special teamer. I mean, I, I think that's kind of how I view him, you know, mm-hmm. um, but but not a bad player. I like the way he played football, so I like his I like his attitude. You can use guys like that on your team, but we'll see. Not not a guy I would value highly, you know. Again, mid day three kind of guy, you know. I'll Maybe throw, late day I'll, three. I'll throw a few things why why people might want like him. Um, just some smaller things, you know. Team captain, that's always a plus. He had zero penalties this year, so he's a very technically sound guy. He's not going to get you in trouble with the penalties. And he was a he was a gunner. He had a 333 career snaps as a gunner on special mm-hmm. teams. So you bring him in, six round pick. These are the type of guys you're looking for because they if they're not going to contribute on defense right in that way. At least they can contribute on special teams. And he can and he can work hard to earn his way onto the field during defense. I mean, for a six round pick type, not bad, right? Mm-hmm. Um, all right, let's move on. Number eleven, you got this one. Sure. So. This next one, we had some discussion about this one, but this is uh Mason Smith, and it's it's somebody who we talked about in our uh in our defensive line preview going into this year. Um, we did summer 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 scouting. Mason Smith was a he was a five star recruit coming into uh college and had you know a really solid freshman year. Um, you know, nothing spectacular. And, you know, that 57.2 PFF grade doesn't necessarily do it justice because, you know, you know, four sacks for a freshman on, in the SEC, like that's pr- that's pretty damn good. And, you know, there was a lot of hope for him going to the second year. And then he tore his ACL in the first game of the season. Um, yeah. And, Unfortunate. You know, yep. And this year, he you know, it was really his first year starting. And he's and he's worked his way back from it, and he you know had a pretty solid year. Um, you definitely, I the positives. I definitely think you can see the athlete when you watch him this year that he was in 2021. I think he's really started to gain that back, which is the important thing. Uh, he moves really well laterally, and he has really strong hands. Uh, you know, something we mentioned about him is when you look at his side, Mason Smith. Six five, three hundred and six pounds. So, um, you know, when you look at some of the prototypes of what Andre Patterson has worked with, what the Giants have drafted, they've really prioritized like these longer and bigger defensive line prospects. Um, you know, the the DJ Davidsons and the uh, Jordan Rileys of the world, like you know, they were bigger, but you know, they liked those guys because they were also tall they weren't they that that's something they value so um basin smith is a guy who desperately needs good coaching he's somebody needs to come in and needs a coach to work with him and you know if you can get him to his ceiling i think you're looking at like a like a pro bowl type defensive lineman like he really has a great ceiling um, and he's definitely one of the guys that I have my eye on for um, pairing up with Andre Patterson. I think that's something that you always should keep in mind as a Giants fan, especially when it's a need that I want to like we have a few advantages on this coaching staff where we can get some of these developmental guys with. And Andre Patterson is one of them um, on Brugler's board. He is 64 overall, second or third round grade. So. You'd probably be hoping to get him at 70 if you want to get him. Um, so what, what what are some of your thoughts on Mason Smith, Sal? Uh, 35-inch arms. 35-inch um, arms is freakishly like ridiculous mm-hmm. wingspan for an interior D lineman. And he's a strong kid. Uh, probably would have been viewed as a top five interior D lineman were he healthy. I think in coming in his first year up in the ACL, you saw some – issues with his recovery uh bottom line is i think he's got the traits that you have to develop but if you develop him you may be getting like a starting three tech that's a monster pass rusher and run defender just because of his his arm length and his raw strength given to andre patterson you might unlock a beast here to me this comes down to where you have to take him because you do have to be patient with him you have because he didn't get the development in college he missed a year he's only 21. um i'm not comfortable taking him at 70. um I'm a little bit more comfortable at 107 or beyond. And listen, don't be surprised if he falls. Guys like this do tend to fall well, because of injury, yeah. their production falls, you know, like, and people are like, how did that guy fall? It's because teams are looking for more short things in the top 100, you know, and Mason Smith is not a short thing right now. Um, <clears throat> the guy who's going to go probably in his territory or maybe a little after him 
that you the Giants may be debating between or him and the other another 21 year old, almost the same age, Leonard Taylor. Yeah, you and I had the debate. Who would you take? You know, and I think Leonard Taylor maybe has l- less development to reach than Mason Smith, but he already has an 18% pass rush win rate. He's already kind of an elite interior pass rusher. There's something already there, right? And so mm-hmm. it's going to be interesting debate. But no, I'd be happy with Mason Smith, but I, not at 70. To me, he's a guy that I, I I would wait till day three to get him. Yeah, I understand where you're coming from with that. I wouldn't mind it, especially just given who our coach is. I think I would care a lot more if we didn't have Andre Patterson. But, you know, trying to capitalize on the coaches we have, I, I've been really looking for us to take a shot on one of these high ceiling guys. You know, if you if you think you can get better value with like a Leonard Taylor with the next pick, I could definitely – see that route or just Leonard Taylor over Mason Smith. I see them in similar tiers. So th- um, this is, this is where the horizontal board matters, right? Cause I think these yeah. are guys who are really lumped together in the same tier and it's up to the, the scouts and Joe Shane to kind of get a feel for where they're going. That's going to tell you whether or not they take a swing at 70 or 107 or later, you know, depending on how, how they set up their board, how picks move around on draft day. But I wouldn't be upset with just as a player, man, I wouldn't be upset with Mason Smith. I just wouldn't expect too much out of him next year. That's all. Yeah. I understand that. I'll say this just in general. I hope they do take a shot on one of these talented upside defensive linemen. Mason Smith's one of those guys we can, you know, Rucororo, Leonard Taylor. There's a lot of guys we can go over with that, but um, I hope they take a shot on one of them. Okay. Let's go to number 12. Uh, we'll, I promise you we'll move quicker now. Um, Andrew Phillips, defensive back from Kentucky. Uh, some of you may have been following the Giants beat, hearing the interest on, on, in this guy. Five foot ten, just under a shade under five eleven, 190 pounds. Um, he is 22 years old, 22 and a half, you know, senior. The way I would summarize him is he's a hyper aggressive player. You know, he plays the ball, he plays with kind of a, like a frenzied approach as a defensive back. Uh, you know, decent production, starter for two years, played on the outside. I think he can play on the inside also. He's versatile. Um, they played a lot of zone in Kentucky. Um, and that I think is what's attractive for the Giants because he can play outside and as as a nickel in a zone system. Which you know you're getting you, again. You, you see like the trend building of the guys they're looking at, right? You're learning about what Shane Bowen might be valuing guys who have like nickel and outside versatility who play off man and zone. I mean these guys all fit that prototype. I would say he's a less controlled version of Shao Smith Wade. You know, a little mm-hmm. bit more chaotic, maybe a little more upside. I actually like, like Shao Smith Wade a little bit more uh, when I went back I and watched the film. Same. Yeah. Right. I think he, he's a he's a safer bet. Right. For being like a more reliable player. And I think reliable matters in that in the secondary. Um, but he's a strong kid. He's explosive. He's got he's quick and agile. Um, I think he's a little bit hyper aggressive. I think he has a lot of penalties in his future in the NFL mm-hmm. with the way he plays. That's what scares me about him. That's kind of my he's versatile. He's tough. But I think there's some issues about his game that I'm not sure translate without penalties. What do you think? Yeah, man. I mean, if. I went into these guys blind watching them. I would have not told you. I would have not been able to know that Andrew Phillips was one who was supposed to be a second to third rounder who Dane Brugler is 61 on his big board. I think it's um, way too high. Yeah. Yeah. I, he, he loves them. This is one of his guys. And, you know, you know, yeah, I'm sure he's watched much more Andrew Phillips than I have. So, you know, if that may, maybe there's more to see there, but from what I watched, I did not like Andrew Phillips that much. He's a fine right. player, but like I said, I like Shao Smith Wade more. And he's supposed to go in the six rounds. I thought, right. I thought Andrew Phillips was a guy who was on the smaller side. I thought he was a feisty player. Who you no, know, I'll say, I'll say this. Maybe him playing in the zone defense is something that wasn't a great fit for him, and was a reason that. I didn't really like him. Maybe if he played in a more man heavy system because of how like aggressive he plays that he could have like stuck to the hip of these guys better and, you know, would have been a uh, opportunity to like make plays on the ball. But in the zone, I just constantly saw him leaving these, these uh, uh, giving these wide receivers way too much space. And when you have a mix between a guy who gets grabby and gets, penalties and also is not like constantly on the hips of these guys like you know uh, Deontay Banks was constantly on the hips guys yes he got some penalties you know you can talk without horn you can talk with a ton of guys who have been oh had that but they stuck on the hips of the guys that's not Andrew Phillips um you know he got 
comped to Roger McCreary, which I do think is interesting because Shane Bowen, he, they drafted Roger McCreary. Apparently, Joe mm-hmm. Shane was interested in Roger McCreary that year. That's yeah. what we heard. So, you know, similar arm length too, like 31 inches, you know, mm-hmm. just above so, the threshold. Yeah. Yeah. So, Look, and I mean he's a good he's a good athlete. If you check his uh his combine numbers, you know, he he ran a four four eight, he had a six nine eight uh three cone, a four two nine short short shuttle, forty two inch vert jump, like very, very good athlete. And we have a very good defensive back coach in Jerome Henderson to work with them. Um, you know, maybe he they he'll be a better fit in our offense. Maybe I didn't, you know, watch enough of uh the tape to really get an idea, but I I did not see the hype that's that people have for Andrew Phillips. If I'm spending a day two pick of that value on a cornerback, this answers the question K Mac is asking. I'm using it on Mikey Sanders still, who's a much better version of this type of player. Um, much better version. Although he's more of a nickel, but that's an I mean, that guy's a leader on your football field. He's a difference maker. I don't view Andrew Phillips the same way. I didn't see that, you know. So uh I'm I don't like where they're projecting him if that's where he goes. Um if I was stacking the vert- the horizontal board, I'd have him and Shout Smith Smithwick pretty much in the same place. Um, maybe you throw in guys like Max Melton in that group, right? And I think Max Melton is mm-hmm. better than both of them, you know. So um, we'll get to him, but you know, I, I, I'm he's good. I won't be upset if they take him. I'll be upset if they take him early on day two. I think that yeah. bother me a lot. You know, I don't think he's good enough for that personally. So that's just kind of how it is we'll see there there's but there i think that you're seeing the prototype they like right and I, I appreciate that they like these versatile guys who can play off man who are click and close good hands at the catch point um it seems like guys it's like like they value guys like that and they also seem to be valuing dbs who can tackle well you know all of these guys are mm-hmm. good tacklers uh so yeah. something to yeah. pay attention to i mean i would say there's definitely some room to grow with Charles with Wade and Andrew Phillips as tacklers, but they're always they're aggressive players who are yeah. always kind of put there in position. They need to improve as ta- I would say they're good run defenders. They're not great tacklers. That's probably the best way to phrase it with them because they put themselves in position, but they always they don't always make the play like they should be. That's fair. All right, let's go to thirteen. You got this All right. one, I believe. Yep, this is the one I do have. This one was an interesting one. I'll tell you guys, um, it is not easy to find tape on an offensive lineman who played for uh, a university of British Columbia, but, um, <laughs> so I can't, I'll be lying to you if I told you I really had any tape on this guy, but Giovanni Manu, um, from British Columbia, he's six, seven and three eighths. He's 352 pounds, uh, he is a monster. I mean, you you can go to the side. He wasn't on the PFF list. So as you can see, we we brought some of the freak list here. And, and anybody watching, you can kind of read what uh, uh, Brugler had to say about him. But He's from, the, he's from Tonga. Yeah. The, the, the one thing I will say, though, that where this could be interesting, we have an assistant GM named Brandon Brown. And Brandon Brown came from the Philadelphia Eagles. And the person who found their left tackle, Jordan Malata, who is out of Wales, uh, was Brandon Brown. Brandon Brown brought brought him to Jeff Stoutland, and Jeff Stoutland fell in love. Giovanni Manu, 6'7", 352 pounds. Jordan Malata, 6'7", and 346 pounds. Uh, Giovanni Manu ran a 506 40 yard dash. Uh Malata, 512 40 yard dash. 23 b- bench reps for Manu. Malata 22. Um a 467 20 yard shuttle for Malata and a but in a what was it? A 481 for Manu. So, you know, maybe, maybe this is a Brandon Brown guy. And maybe he's ta- he's trying to go back to the well and see if he can uh can do it again and find us another sleeper. Um, Brugler has him listed as a priority free agent. So, you know, I, I would hope that either it would be us like trading, getting our pick in the seventh round or undrafted free agent, if we were going to get them. But, uh, you know, that's the only thing I have to say about him. I don't have much here, but uh, the Malata comparison there, 
as far as a you know foreign a foreign country guy who hasn't you know didn't play football till later later in his career, maybe something to be had there. Uh, but that's all I have. I got nothing. He's Polynesian yeah. and he's he's all he's all projection. So let's go. That's <laughs> a UDFA candidate. Uh, we'll see. So right. Let somebody we, take this one on him. We got your guy. All right, number fourteen, Ben Sinat, my guy, tight end from Kansas State, six foot three. Almost six foot four, two hundred and fifty pounds. Fourth year junior, two year starter. You guys have all heard me talk about Benson not ad nauseum. I'm not going to go into too much other than saying I told you so, because all of a sudden everybody in the media has learned who Benson Ott is, and like, oh, he might be tight end too. Mike uh, certainly, uh, Matt Waltman thought so last week. You know, um, Benson Ott's awesome. He's a good route runner. He's a very, he's just a really good tight end. Great route receiver, great route runner for a tight end. Very good with the act. Doesn't you know? Doesn't he's not going to run away from people with speed, but he's going to win through contact balance. Positions himself well. Doesn't drop the ball. Shields defenders the ball. Uh, disp- and still able to run good routes. Great hands catcher. Very solid run game blocker in space, especially when he's moving in space. I think that's where he excels. Right, he's a great move blocker. Not the kind of guy you're going to put in line to dominate, but he does a decent job of like walling off edge rushers and creating some you know positional type blocks. Good, he's a starting tight end in the NFL. I think he's very similar to Daniel Bellinger, maybe a better receiver than Daniel Bellinger, and not quite as good a blocker as Daniel Bellinger, but in, in that same mold, H back, fullback. By now, you guys have all heard about him. I've seen his his uh, range go from anywhere from round two to round four. Brugler has him as a fourth round. I think that's about right for him. So pick 107, I think I would be very interested in Ben Sinat if he's still on the board. Uh, and again, I, I do think Joe Shane's going to manipulate the draft board. So I don't know where we're picking at this point. But um, I'd be, you know, if you told me we got Ben Sinat at 107, I would be pretty happy. I I probably would be happy with him at 70. Um, it depends on what we do with the other two picks, though. Like, if we have a quarterback in the first round and we're looking for Ben Sinat to round out that guy's name, specifically if we get J.J. McCarthy, right, uh, or even Drake May, those are guys who use tight ends over the middle um, and, and will we'll use the middle of the field. I think getting a guy like Ben Sinat would be very helpful. But where you take him, as much as I love him, I think depends on that decision. And honestly, I, I feel like he's more of a 107-ish type pick. What about you? Yeah, man, he's interesting. You've you've definitely sold me on him. Uh, also, you know, the combine numbers definitely were a big big sell for me. I mean, you look at a guy who ran a four six eight, jumped forty inches, a six eight two three cone. Like this guy is a total athlete. Uh, did you see? It was on Twitter today. There was a scout that had an interesting comp for Ben Sinat. Did Did you see that today? No, was so, it Daniel Bellinger? Nope, I'll read it to you. Scout on Ben Sinat. This guy is a little like Kittle. His combine numbers are outstanding. They line him up all over. He can run routes. He's quick, fast, gets his head to the ball quickly, and strong catching it. Tough dude after the catch, aggressive blocker. Yeah. He's not as good in an inline blocker as Kittle. Because mm-hmm. um, Kittle can take out edge rushers. I mean, I've, I've seen yeah. Kittle. T- I remember Kittle took uh, Aiden Hutchinson and, and like, just drove him into the ground, which was like crazy to watch. I don't know if you remember that from the NFC title game. I don't see Benson not doing that, not yet at least. But yeah, I mean, I see it. I, I see that play style. I think he has tremendous value. And listen, if you love, if the Giants love him, they want to take him at 70, I'm not going to be upset. I'll love it. But I just, I think guys like Benson not typically don't go that high. You know what I mean? Like I think they they tend to go around to pick 100. I'd be, I, I think Brugler's right on this. Um, but I listen. If we walk away with Benson out somewhere in the draft, I'd be thrilled. And I think at having him and Daniel, I've been, I I don't care what Darren Waller does. I don't think he's going to be on the Giants next year anyway. To me, having a two wide, a two tight end rotation led by these guys would be awesome with Bellinger and Sonat. I think they're interchangeable parts. They add a lot of versatility to the to the uh, offense. Tight ends who are tight ends in name only, but they're really just big slot receivers. Don't do anything for me because they don't mask your offense, right? Like. But like they're just receivers. Give me guys who can who can you can line up as fullbacks or in line, guys who can be lined up in the slot, but guys who mask what you're doing on offense. Um, that I think is the value of having a tight end because they can they can protect your run game, they can open up your pass game. I think Sonat is that prototype. Uh, I'll tell you uh, one thing I like about Sonat is he checks all my boxes for for a tight end that, that so far this offseason. I mean, and looking at the film, one. 
athleticism. That is like one of the most important things when you're looking at tight ends. Tight ends are so they're not used well in college. Nobody uses their tight ends correctly. When you're when you are projecting a tight end to the NFL, athleticism is so much more important there than almost any other position. He has that. You look, I look for a guy who has ability after the catch because you know we talked about this a little bit with Waldman last week. When you look at the best players, especially early on in their career, about how they find success, it's about what they do after the catch. You know, you look at the Kittles, you look at the Gronks, you look at the Kelsey's, you look at whoever. They are so good after the catch. And three, you look at a guy who can block. You got you want a guy who is who can help your run game and be a good blocker. And Sanat has that. So yeah. I'm I would be, you know, I I would think we'd get a good player if we took Sonata 70. I wouldn't love it. I probably wouldn't like it who we took it over. I'd I'd be fine with with, at, with him at 107. Let's split the difference. I would trade down from 70 to acquire extra picks and then maybe drag grab him in the 80s, you know? Yeah. Or the 90s. I I mean if that's what it took, I would love to have him on the team. But I am, you know, when, when draft day comes as much, I, I'm not a just so you guys know, I'm not a my guy kind of guy. When it comes to the draft, like I believe there are good players up and down the draft. I believe in setting up the board. I believe in trusting your process. I believe in the horizontal board where you, you kind of rank guys in tiers. And, you know, I think it's less about the individual player you're drafting and more about your plan as an organization, right? How you're going to use them. And you should take advantage of value on draft. You should be ready to let go of my guy mentality for the sake of getting maximal value for your roster. Um, I wasn't a huge fan of how they handled last year's draft. And I think people who were with me on draft day know that, you know, that I didn't love the trade up for Deontay Banks. I like Deontay Banks, but trading two picks on day three to move up one spot when it was highly improbable that anybody was going up to get Deontay Banks with Joey Porter Jr. on the board kind of pissed me off. I'll be honest, you know, um, because at the time we, we were in a wink Martindale system and they both fit perfectly. In fact, I would say Joey Porter Jr. Would have fit better. Um, they're certainly evenly ranked and giving up picks for that is not something I, I don't believe that my guy stuff. I felt the same way about Jalen Hyde. You know how I felt about Hyde. I liked him, but I didn't love the idea of giving over fourth round pick to move up a few spots to get him. Cause I thought there were other receivers that were in that territory that we could have been okay with like speed guys. Right. So I'm not of that mentality where I'm okay with just reaching or trading up for my guy. I think you have to set up your board fairly, put these guys in groupings that are fairly even and trust your process. But listen, if there is a my guy I have in this class, it's probably this guy. Yeah. I mean, we definitely disagree a little bit with that philosophy. I definitely hear you, but um, but yeah, I would he, he is a he's been a your guy a hundred percent throughout this process. Yeah. Um, the other Let's guy go, we yeah. have. Yeah, yeah, another guy from Kansas, Kansas State, State here. Yeah. Um your guy. BB. <laughs> Everybody else's guy on Giant Twitter. Except um, for the two of us. <laughs> yeah, Cooper BB. Um, look, Cooper BB is a guy that we reviewed in our interior offensive line preview. He is a very good college guard. He's been very successful. Um, he is a big dude. If you're looking for the big guard who who uh is just hard to move and can, you know, get in, fr- stay in front of people decently well and, and all that type of stuff. Cooper BB is your guy. The issue is that he doesn't have great arm length. He is very, really not that quick laterally from what I could see. Um, you know, it's interesting how a lot of people look at him differently. Um, you know, for example, Brugler has him. Number 38 on his big board, which I totally disagree with. Um, mm-hmm. uh, he has him ahead of Christian Haynes, which I totally disagree with. I yeah, I have Christian nuts. Haynes much, much higher than him. And then, you know, it's funny. One w- There was one game you and I both watched, Sal, that I hear a lot of people reference is the uh, Texas game for Cooper. Oh, I, I hated him in that game. People love him in that game. It, I thought he was it's terrible. It's so <laughs> funny. I mean, yeah. I, I heard... I know we've our guy DK liked him that game. I know Goon liked him this game. I was listening to Talking Giants and Bobby Skinner was talking about how he played well in that game. People got different answers. I'll say he didn't get beat in that game, but to me it showed his deficiencies. That's yeah. what it was. What like no Byron Murphy wasn't like constantly like wrecking havoc, 
but I saw him like having to wash Bry- Byron Murphy right down the middle of the line because because he, he was one gapping right past him. Right. Yeah. He was too. He was too athletic, too quick, too agile for him. He couldn't handle that. Mm-hmm. And it was so. And it was a. It was something for me with some other guys where I'm like, yeah, he's a bigger guy, but he's a really good technical player, which he is. He's a. He's a very good offensive lineman, and it shows. He's technically sound and all of that, but. There is just physical deficiencies where I worry about him going up against those quicker guys and getting, especially at the next level, getting totally blown up. With that said, look, I I still like think Cooper Beebe is one of the better offensive linemen in this draft. He just isn't necessarily my style of lineman. I second round, I would be furious if we took him. I do not think he is at all that seventy. Yeah, I mean, although he's not my style, I do think it's a good value for him. Um, you know, he's he's worth looking into back to back Big Twelve um, offensive lineman of the year. He's the first guy to do that since Creed Humphrey. Um, really, really good player. Um, it's mostly the the athleticism and and size concerns for me. Uh, where I I I really just want to lean more towards these athletic linemen. I think that's where I'm kind of going. Do uh, you have anything to add to that, Sal? Um, yeah, I, I agree with everything you said. I think I'm going to stick to our evaluation. We have, we watched him play football, you know, we did tape review and we're like, this guy's technically sound. He's a good, he's like, a, he's like a plow when he, like he can, he can plow the field for you. You know, like when he gets mm-hmm. his hands on people, he's very, he's very good with leverage and strength. So once he's got his hands on you and he's latched on, he's tough to get around because he's going to push guys backward open running lanes that's his game and he's he's very technically proficient i i appreciate that about him but like you said like i think in the nfl these defensive linemen are getting more quick more agile there 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 are a lot of these one gappers who are going to feast on this guy because he just doesn't have on tape the lateral agility and athleticism to handle them what's interesting is at the combine he went crazy he mm-hmm. blew it up the dude tested elite he had a 930 composite score he had a i mean the the, the metric that matters most for interior offensive linemen is their short shuttle and he had a 481 short shuttle which was elite you know and a 7443 cone which was elite he ran a 503 40 yard dash which was elite same thing with his 20 yard split 10 yard split his speed and agility testing were elite that's awesome right you would think technically pro- pro- sound he has that kind of athleticism this guy's going to be a pro bowler but he doesn't play like that and mm-hmm. that's what concerned me like it doesn't show up on tape with pads on I feel like this guy might be a, a guy who, like, people will look at the combine and say, oh, there it is. There's the athleticism and talk themselves out of what their eyes show him, show them, you know, on tape in terms of his combine and in terms of his athleticism, which is limited. Where I land on him is I think he's a good player. I would have no problem with drafting him. I wouldn't take him on day two. And I have a feeling he could slide to day three um, because mm-hmm. of what his tape shows. So if somebody takes him on day two, great, take him. I don't want him. I'd much rather have the guys who have positional versatility or a guy like Christian Haynes, who is really that athlete who can do everything, who's, I think, a much more sound blocker in every way. So um, I'm not a big fan of his. I wouldn't be upset if we took him, but I would be upset if we took him too early. Same mm-hmm. as yeah. Um, I'll say that he he also did look really good in the drills at the Combine, which also surprised me. He looked much quicker working in those i don't know maybe there's more i mean everybody see this we're not alone in our evaluation that he looks slow laterally at, at, at the college level maybe there's more you can unlock but you're not necessarily banking on that you're going off the film it's you know kind of like the discussion we had with michael Penix after he really ran really well it's nice that you have it but at the end of the day you're still going by what you saw in the film maybe there's more that you can do there and figure it out but you're looking at the film at the end of the day yep all right let's move on to the next guy um, and we'll do this real quick. Number 16, Jaden Daniels, quarterback from LSU, 6'3", 210 pounds. Uh, Heisman Trophy winner, uh, had an outstanding season at LSU this year. He was a two-year starter at LSU after transferring from Arizona State. Um, really blew up this year in his final year, went crazy as a dual threat. This guy is your classic, you know, he's like your modern, true dual threat. He can beat you with his arm, beat you with his legs, elite runner. I forgot how many would he run for like a thousand yards or something like that this year. Some ridiculous number had a total of like close to, you know, 40 some odd touchdowns, close to 50, if I'm not mistaken. Um, 
great throwing the ball when it come, came to deep deep balls, touch passes, slot fades, great mm-hmm. accuracy. Really utilized the weapons he had at LC really, you know, really well. I'm not going to hold it against him that he had Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas Jr. because he used them. He maximized them, especially mm-hmm. on the deep ball. And I give him credit for that. He was outstanding this year. My criticism of him is well documented. I feel like, and, you know, maybe he answered some of the velocity questions I had at his pro day. I appreciated that about him. Yeah, he did throw he well. Really, and he threw the ball well. But on his tape consistently, he, and in his production, there's a middle of the field problem with him. Um, it, it's something about him. I don't know if it's the way the offense is designed or he just doesn't take the, the plays, but he will leave a lot of meat on the bone over the middle of the field. He depended almost exclusively on throwing outside the numbers and a lot of slot fades and deep balls to really enhance his production this year. He also was a fifth year player that took, you know, nearly the full five years to break out. Um, so there are some red flags there. Some of that stuff may not translate. There is a little bit of boomer bust to him, but at the end of the day, I think his elite traits as a runner and throwing the deep ball are adequate to give him a fairly high floor in the NFL. So if you're, I, I think, I'm, I don't think he's going to bust out of the NFL or anything like that. I think he's going to be a solid player. I do think he needs some online help in the NFL level. I don't think he can play with reckless abandon and get clocked the way he does in college at the NFL. I think he'll die if he does that in the NFL. Good, um, good so thing he has have, Bobby Johnson. Oh yeah, Bobby Johnson. <laughs> Bobby Johnson and J- and Jaden Daniels is, is a match made in hell. Um, I mean, for that for that young man's sake, not that I want anything good to happen in that organization, but for that young man's sake, I hope he learns how to run out of bounds because Bobby Johnson will get him killed. But anyway, outstanding player. I don't think he's getting past the second pick. I don't think he's he's getting past the third pick. If somehow he did, I could see him being in play for the Giants because I think he would fit what Brian Dable would like to do. That's kind of all I've got on him. What about you? Anything else to add on him? Yeah, I mean, look, I'll, I'll say my last good things about Jaden Daniel before he comes a commander, and then I'll just shit on him for the rest of his career. Um, yeah. But before that's official, um, you know, he is a guy who has a, elite skills. So that's, you know, that's why you interested him. He's an elite deep ball thrower. He's an elite runner. Although, like, he, I see the Lamar comparisons. I don't necessarily see that. I think he's more of a, you know, he kind of stands straight up and he, he has got more straight line speed, but he's got incredible vision, incredible at setting up defenders in open field. He's, he, he's really, really talented as a runner. Um, and you know, those two things together can, can really lead to a high end quarterback in this league. Um, but the one thing that worries me is I, I see him in a similar light to, uh, Justin Fields and, you know, some of the issue concerns we saw with Justin Fields, you, um, you know, you saw some processing issues with him. You saw issues with him in the pocket where, you know, he, Justin Fields had a really bad pressure to sack rate in college and that carried over to the NFL and was one of his downfalls. Historically, Jaden Daniels is one of the, one of the worst, uh, you know, top quarterbacks that we've seen with pressure to sack rate. He improved it this year, but even then it was still like 22%. I think historically in, in college, it's like 26% or something. It's, it's not, high. It's up there. Yeah. Not good. So, you know, I see a lot of Justin Fields, you know, Justin Fields got ruined by the Bears organization. It's yeah. going to be up to Washington not to ruin uh, Jaden Daniels because I could see him going down that same path. But I could also see him, you know, he has the talent to become one of the better players in this league. It's it's up to Washington to make sure that they get, they build around him in the right way. I want to move on before we do. Uh, the, you, for those who don't know, the Washington Commanders had like a round robin speed dating uh, prospect session yesterday, where they brought in all of the quarterbacks outside of Caleb. They brought in Jaden Daniels, JJ McCarthy, Drake May, Michael Penix. Uh, all these guys came in to Dallas Airport at the same time, essentially, uh, and they brought him for the facility, and they and they had a bunch of other prospects all coming at the same time to meet. Um, almost like this weird speed dating like thing like the scene out of batman where like you know like they where the joker broke the stick and was like i have one job and he threw it between like three guys or whatever you know and um it was a weird thing to do um apparently they picked up j apparently mike zimmer and adam peters like personally picked up Jaden Daniels and other people got the other guys, uh, which was weird. <laughs> anyway, on Twitter today, somebody, a, a commander's fan kind of criticized the process and what is this? This is like a terrible way to like bring in these players. Like they're not going to play against each other. Why would you do this to them? I hate this. Right. Somebody wrote that. And apparently Jaden Daniels uh, agent liked it. 
and then somebody found it and screenshotted it before he could delete the like. So it tells you a little something about like how their their process was. Uh, I said Mike Zimmer. I'm sorry. I meant Dan Quinn. I apologize. Um, thinking, thinking about the other guy. But yeah, I'm thinking about the other Cowboys coach. Uh, but, uh, you know, like, so they, yeah, I mean, like, I think the process was screwy and I don't think it was appreciated. Um, so, mm-hmm. You know, and if his eight his agent liked it, and you know, once you like something and somebody screenshots it, you're screwed. It's it's out there forever. Uh, I don't know how that's going to fly with uh, the commanders. I will say that that approach, uh, thanks to Ask Seven, who mentioned this to me and reminded me of this, but that's a very Josh Harris thing, um, which is the financial world bullshit of like the the final interview being like a kind of like a, a royal rumble, you know, type approach to things. It's a it's a very shitty like finance bro way of doing things. I don't know what it shows you for a quarterback, but um, I'm hoping it it's it's very Dan Snydery, and that makes me happy. I hope they get another 30 years of Dan Snyder like ownership and go straight to hell. Uh, that's all. <laughs> no offense to my buddy the Beard, who's a very nice man, who I met recently because I live in the area. But I just wanted to mention that part. Um, let's go to 17. Um, all right, um, seven. Yeah, 17. Trey Benson out of Florida State, six foot, two hundred and sixteen pounds. Uh, Trey Benson, I think if the if you were gonna make a consensus RB one, I think a lot of people say would say it was Trey Benson. You might make an argument for Jonathan Brooks, depends how you view him with that injury. But Trey Benson, and it was our RB one when we did our initial rankings going into the season. Uh, he is a guy who has had really really good production um breaking tackles he has had a very high missed tackle uh percentage it was i think he had the highest missed tackle uh break percentage in 2022 in like pfs pff history um you know again he broke in our 45 tackles this year and 550 51 yards after contact with all that said you know this guy on top of that you know he what he ran like a four three nine or something like that at the combine. Um, so he is a very, very good athlete. He is a very, and he's a very solid running back who has decent vision and, and can break tackles. Uh, you know, I saw that Brugler compared him to, uh, Melvin Gordon. And I, mm-hmm. I, I can see that comp there. Uh, he's a guy who has, uh, you know, ability to, catch the ball out of the backfield and also has ability to uh, be, uh, I think, an every down back for you. So um, I think he offers a good floor and a good ceiling. If we were going to take a guy in the third round, this this would be my pick, a running back. Yeah, and I think he projects right around that territory. I think Brugler has him 81 overall. PFF has him 75. So he's kind of in that, like, you know, um, sort of like late 60s to 80s kind of territory, right? That's where he's probably going to go. He's in that, in my opinion, that first batch of running backs, you know, who will likely become off the board. I think they're going in a, in a bunch. Uh, guys like Jonathan Brooks is coming off the ACL, Jalen Wright, Blake Corum, Trey Benson. I think those are your four most likely backs to be taken early. And when I say early, I mean, you know, somewhere between the end of the second and the middle of the third, somewhere in that territory. Um so like sort of the, the middle, the, the meat and potatoes section of day two. I like Benson, man. He's a good runner. I think he's consistently better as a gap runner. That's what they ran at Florida State. They ran a lot of push, uh, like a lot of pin pull concepts, a lot of GT counter, a lot of stuff the Giants run, actually. Um, will the Giants keep running it? Our, our buddy Goon, you know, has been making a point. He's right that, you know, they, they drafted John Michael Schmitz and he did not. That's not that was not his game in college. He was a zone blocker. He was a guy who who could climb, combo block and climb. Mm-hmm. He wasn't he wasn't the athlete that you need to kind of pull and run us out outside and 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 open up running lanes. And so he was he showed that he was late on a lot of blocks doing that. I don't think he has the kind of foot speed for that. Um, so if you're gonna if you're gonna stick with John Michael Schmitz as your center, which you should, you just drafted him in the second round. Are you really going to run that scheme a lot? It's, it, it, it's an interesting question because if your center can't do it, it limits you quite a bit. So um, I am a little bit concerned about that part of it. But as an athlete, I like Trey Benson a lot. I think you could do a lot better. He's an any down back, good receiver, good runner, good vision, good contact balance, all the stuff you look for. Not a superstar, but a very solid back. Um, and that's how I look at him. 
Any any other thoughts oh, on him? Nope, I agree. Um, want to go ahead and move on to the next guy? Let's do it. So the next guy on our list is Kool Aid McKinstry, defensive back from Alabama, cornerback. 5'11", 196 pounds, third-year player. He was our cornerback one coming into this year. He fell mm-hmm. off a little bit because of his teammate and, Qu- and Quinion Mitchell, but he didn't really fall off. He had a great year. Just wasn't quite as yeah. good as the other guys. Quinion, it was already uh, a tight race, too, and we are kind of going through it. Exactly. Um, I really like Cooley McKinstry. I think he's being – he's another one of these guys whose prospect status, I don't understand why it's – as low as it is he does have a jones fracture in his foot which which uh he's healing from but he tested really well despite doing that through the jones fracture which is mm-hmm. remarkable tells you something about the kind of person he is right and he tested through that um three-year starter he's basically an outside press man corner but i think he can play off man too because he's quite a good athlete he played as a freshman under nick saban and was like a lead defensive back under nick saban that says a lot uh, mr db coach himself right um he got better every year. He doesn't have like elite like burst. I think that's mm-hmm. the knock on him, right? But he's a very fluid mover. He can play and press. I think he'd be very good in zone also. Um, great. He uses his length really well. It shows up on film consistently where he, he's outstanding at the catch point. He shields receivers and he gets his hands up there to block the balls down. Um, if you could get him, and I think he sort of got that first, second round grade, he's going to go somewhere in that, t- probably in that 20 to 45 range. I wouldn't be upset if he fell to 47, if the Giants hopped on, on Kool-Aid McKinstry at 47, that would be a high, high, high value pick right there. And I can see him getting there. Now I can see him going into the twenties also, but you know, guys like this fall sometimes we're in this range mm-hmm. for, because teams have other needs and maybe they say, oh, he's got a fracture in his foot. I don't want to take him. He's a young player, man. Like he's only 21. Um, I'd be thrilled with taking Cooley and McKinstry. What do you think? I would love if he fell to 47. I would. I remember I was kind of something that was on. We had a 39th pick. I was like, this is the guy who I could see falling, and that's why I wanted at 39. Definitely less likely yeah. now at 47. You know, but to be fair, I was saying that even before we knew about the the foot fracture, just because of how deep this cornerback group is at the top, like. You know, five cornerbacks go in the first round, and Cooley and McKinstry could not be one of them. Like, that's how good this group is. You know, I think it's it's funny where Cooley has not fallen in my mind. It's just other guys have r- risen above him. Outside of the foot injury, obviously, that worries you a little bit. But, like, I remember look, when we talked about him in our preview and we kind of did our first mock and he, we put him like in the twenties, I was kind of, even though he was our CB one and we put him in the twenties, I was like, look, he's a really good player. He just always felt like a guy who was more of just like a safe player than a high. Like, I think this guy is going to be like a top five cornerback in the league. He's a guy that I think you draft, especially if he can be your cornerback too. I would love him there because he can just be a lockdown guy who you don't really have to worry about, but is isn't you don't necessarily have to put him on the best wide receivers in the NFL. If you put him on, just be a lockdown guy and teams wide receiver two, that's my ideal situation. He can he can play man. He'll and he will he will absolutely be fine. You don't have to worry about him at all. Um, I thought Brugler's comp for him was interesting. He says game reminds him of James Bradbury. He's um, faster than Bradbury. He is, but I I do see it like where neither of them were uh, necessarily like the flashy type corners, but they both just sound. Play, yeah, yeah, they both technically sound just played the position so well. Um, I I think Kool Aid McKinstry would be my dream pick at forty seven. Yep. I think that's the guy who like maybe could fall. And that I would run that pick to the podium. He he did hurt the cause of falling with his performance at his pro day. Yeah, uh, he ran. I mean, I mean, again, a Jones fracture is like a is like a small small bone fracture in the foot. It, it is painful, and the dude and he, he needed surgery for it. So he had his pro day just a few days before he had foot surgery, and he still he still competed. And he ran a somewhere between a four four three and a four four seven forty. He had a thirty four and a half inch uh, vertical and a ten foot one inch broad jump, like. This is like a fractured foot a few days before surgery. Yeah, that is those are elite numbers to begin with, you know, for a guy his length. Um, 
And to do that with a fracture, like everybody's like, this guy's faster than that. He is. He plays faster than that. I think. I really do believe he's faster than that in real time. Uh, you know, when he's not, when he's healthy. So he may not be falling to forty-seven. But listen, teams shy away for the silliest reason sometimes. So if he does, yeah, I'd probably send him the cart for Kool Aid McKinstry at forty-seven. Yeah, a hundred percent. All right. And one thing mm-hmm. I will throw out too is the. Uh, LSU wide receivers, Malik Neighbors and Brian Thomas, they both said Cooley McKinstry is the best uh, cornerback they went against. And and Taron Arnold is a cornerback they went to, and they said Kool-Aid was the the best guy. So, uh, you know, high praise for, from uh, those guys. Absolutely. All right. You want to do number 19? Yeah. Another guy who wasn't on the – PFF big board, um, Chigozi uh, Anusium, I think. I don't, I don't know if I said that right, but he's a he's a cornerback from Colorado State. He's 6'1", 200 pounds. Um, you know, he is the typical size speed corner. That's that's really the first thing you need to know about this guy. He, you know, we just went over six foot two hundred pounds or six foot one two hundred pounds, and he. It, he ran a four three nine. He had a uh, thirty seven and a half inch vertical jump, ten four broad jump, um, four four two short shuttle, seven point oh six three cone. Like this is a very good athlete, and that that's that that's a selling point for him. You know, he played a lot of uh, zone coverage over at Colorado State, but people ultimately see him more as that uh man corner based off of kind of his his side speed traits and i i think that kind of goes into what again what we're looking for here you know we go after these guys who've played a lot of zone but translate well to kind of being man corners that's kind of a theme we've seen with a lot of these uh later round guys and he kind of goes into that again this is probably the best athlete we looked at he is definitely um more of a project than some of those guys but uh you know he is looked at as a seventh round pick this could be your your trey hawkins of this type of draft uh i you know i watched him a little bit he i didn't say anything that special but i also didn't he didn't look like a total liability or anything like that so you know with, with if you can get a guy who's a great athlete and has good size it doesn't look like a total liability when you when you're watching them that's that's a real good start <laughs> um what do you have yeah i think this guy's a value pick um like you said size speed smaller school in colorado state Can't, uh, he played in a cover three system um so he played a lot of zone and a lot of off man he translates very well to press man um i think there are i think if you, you know you see it on tape when you you read the criticisms about him and the scouting report from Ruggler and you you actually watch. He's very fast. He's fluid. He sticks with people. He uses his length very well. He does all those things well, but he's kind of sloppy when the ball gets there. Like he doesn't turn his head around. His hand technique is not the best. You know, like his ball skills aren't the best. So there are some technical issues. I don't know if that's something that they view as coachable. Certainly, that is a strength of Jerome Henderson that he works with his DBs and perfects or at least maximizes their their hand usage at the catch point um to me this is a guy where if you can get him in the seventh round or have you know whenever or a udfa a, a guy like a trey hawkins type he does have the fluidity to, to handle i think he's probably a better prospect than trey hawkins was um yeah and i think in terms of speed and, and, and what he's showing on film if you can get his hands right and you can get some some of the stuff that, that Jerome Henderson is working on, he could be a very useful player with the upside to develop into a starting outside quarterback. I think that's his upside, which is worth it for a late day three pick. You know, you don't get a lot of these guys late. Any earlier than that, I'm not taking them personally. I'm, I don't. It's too much of a project for me to want more than like a seventh round pick on this guy, maybe yeah. sixth. Yeah, I mean, six would be our last pick unless we trade, but. Yeah. Um, you know, no, I, I agree with you. I'll, I'll also add into there that he was apparently a key special teamer for yes. them and he even blocked the field goal this year. So, uh, you know, that's, that's a plus as well. Absolutely. All right. Let's go to number 20. Uh, another one of the guys I really love, you guys have heard me talk, on, talk about it before, uh, Jordan Morgan, offensive t- tackle, I would say. They list him as a lineman, but tackle from Arizona, six foot five, three hundred eleven pounds, fifth year senior. Senior, uh, he was one of our top guys. He might have been our OT four or five in the in our, in our rankings early in the season. 
Um, didn't disappoint. Had a great season at left tackle. Um, he is viewed by a lot of people in the NFL, somebody who might translate to guard, but he definitely can hold up a tackle, I think, in the NFL. Um, that's mainly because of his arm led, which isn't bad. It just doesn't elite. But he is what he's great at is balance. Uh, and his ability to move as a blocker. So he's a, he's a good knee bender. He's very balanced in true pass sets. Um, he mirrors guys very well. He's a great he's a great uh, guy to go to the next level. He's great on you know when he's pulling. Um, he's just very technically sound. You know I think there there is a lot to like about Jordan Morgan. Um, there's nothing he does that's elite. And I've said this before. Like my my view of Jordan Morgan is. You draft him and you stick him at left tackle or right tackle or, or guard. I think a tackle, but you put him there and he may not go to the Pro Bowl. He may not go and become all pro, but he's just going to lock down his side very quietly and in a boring fashion. And you just won't hear his name. Um, and I think that's the kind of tackle. I mean, I, you, you want linemen who are just kind of out of sight, out of mind. That's who Jordan Morgan is. I don't think he's going to drive people into the ground and dominate them and put on like like highlight real like offensive line stuff, he's just going to keep them away from your quarterback. And he's mm-hmm. going to open up lanes that are, you know, he's going to show the athleticism to be useful in the run game. Again, he's going to seal block. He's going to do things that are very technically sound, nothing spectacular. But I really like Jordan Morgan. I, You know, another guy that if he fell to 47, and I, I don't think he will, I think he's going in the first round personally, but I could see him falling to the early third. But if he somehow fell to 47, you have to seriously give this guy consideration because he is a versatile lineman. I think he can be a tackle on either side. He can be a swing tackle. He could play well at guard with with his natural kind of stance and his ability to maintain balance and his strength. He's a little undersized for guard, but he plays so strong, I don't think it's too much of an issue. So that's my take on him. What are your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I agree with everything you said. He He's also just, he's a really good athlete, I would say. He has really, really quick feet. And, you know, he, like you said, he's not somebody who will be burying the defenders and get those big highlight plays. His strength isn't necessarily a big part of his game. He could definitely use some work on his anchor, but he, but if you get him out in an offense where you can get him out in the move and get him to open space in the run game, especially, he could really be somebody, especially if you have him pulling as like a guard or something like that. I think he could be somebody who could help you dominate in that aspect. Um, yeah, I think he, he, you know, he's only played left tackle in college, but I do think he could have some guard tackle versatility. I'm totally with you. If, uh, you know, if he's there at 47, he's he, he's definitely one of a guy I would have a hard time passing on, depending who else is on the board. Um, he he would be a great fit here, and he he would help us. You know, kind of what we talked about when we've been talking about getting a tackle who has guard versatility. And you have a backup plan if Evan Neal's not doesn't work out at right tackle, and he can also play guard if he does. Obviously, J- Jermaine Illuminor also helps with that plan, so it's less of a something you have to do, but still something you would you would prefer. Absolutely. All right, let's go to the next guy. All right, this was this was definitely a my guy going into the year, uh, Jerzon Newton. Uh, he was, this was one of the first groups that we reviewed was the interior defensive line. Cause we assumed this would be a big need for us. And I still think it is just maybe not first round. I don't know how Jerzon Newton can end up a New York giant. I, I don't really see that happening, There's but one way. Me, yeah, <laughs> you, we, there, there is, it could trade well, and, one way. <laughs> yeah. 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 We could trade down, make, make trade of the Vikings, whatnot, who knows, but. Jerzon Newton is the is to me the clear best interior defensive lineman in this draft. I know people are really high on Byron Murphy, and I I understand their love for Byron Murphy. I I'm high on him as well. He is you know a top thirty, but I think he's top twenty player for me or something like that. I'm, I definitely like him, but Jerzon Newton is the the clear top guy in this the the in this group to me. He he is so productive. He's been productive in multiple years. He is really good with his hands. He's so advanced as a pass rusher. He had a 15.4% pass rush win rate and probably a down year for him compared to his last year. His 2022 year was even better. He is perfectly fine in the run game. Like that's honestly underselling him, but he's like, more than adequate he's i would say he's good but maybe not quite the strength it is as a pass rush. he's a little bit undersized 
Um, you know, that's the one thing you could say about him. You know, he's six foot one, five eight, three hundred four pounds. You know, he's not the biggest guy in the world, but I mean, the guy with fifty two tackles and seven and a half sacks this year, one forced fumble. I mean, he he was a team captain, uh, first team All American. He is probably the best defensive lineman that we've ha- come out of college since. Derek Brown. I'm trying to think. Um, I'm trying to think of him thinking of somebody bef- uh, else since then that I'm, I'm missing. But um, he, we've had kind of a lack of top guys recently. And he, he's, be- he's better than Kalaja Kansi was. Um, it might be Derek Brown. You're right. I'm trying to, mm-hmm. I, I think because there was a, the year before it was even worse at defensive line. So yeah, probably Derek Brown. Yeah. So Jerzon Newton. Um, Whoever gets him is is going to be very lucky. He is I I know our guy uh, KSIXI is a really big fan of him. He comped him to Jeffrey Simmons, which is a little smaller, but I I definitely can see the comp. Um, I think he will be a dominant player. Um, you know, I've I've seen a lot of Dolphins fans who are hoping he falls to him, and they they can be their he can be their Christian Wilkins replacement. And I think that that would be a great pick for them if he can get there. Uh, I agree. I, Johnny Newton's awesome. I so the way you get him is if the Giants decide to punt on quarterback early, take the trade down to like the you know middle of the first round for Minnesota, whoever, and they decide BPA at that point is the way we're going. I can easily see Johnny Newton being BPA at like twelve or thirteen or something on their board because you get that pass rusher, you get the, the actual pass rusher you need on the interior, not on the outside. So that's how you get him. Otherwise, I don't really see it. Um, but outstanding football player not much more to add you, you did a great job breaking him down he's going to come in and be an immediate impact defender in the nfl i mean that's the bottom line he's an outstanding three tech and he's just i think he's gonna have a very long nfl career i think i see a lot of pro bowls in this guy's future um let's go to the next guy so the next player is really interesting so we're going to go through like a guy who is not as well known here another defensive tackle and this one had me and monty like just we were shocked at what we discovered when we started looking at this guy. Uh, it's Phil Darius Payne, defensive tackle from Virginia Tech. He's six foot two, two hundred and eighty six pounds. Um, this guy was a grad transfer from Nebraska, I believe. Um, he had he put up some elite testing numbers. He ran a four eight seven forty. He ran a two eight three twenty yard split, a one six five ten yard split at two hundred eighty six pounds. These numbers are bananas. Thirty one inch vertical, nine foot broad jump that's nothing too crazy but at his size it's pretty decent nine seven eight inch hands 33 inch arms that's that's fine 78 and a half inch wingspan which is very good 883 overall ras score um his pff grades were is, is what caught our attention like it ridiculously graded he had an overall grade of 90.5 88.1 run defense and an 86.1 pat, pass rush grade he only missed seven percent of his tackles which is not bad for a guy who plays where he plays in the way he plays and his pass rush win rate was 11.5%, which is really outstanding on the interior. Generated 23 pressures, 31 tackles, four sacks. You watch him on film. There's a little bit of uh, – this guy is kind of like a Kirkland Darius Robinson is what I saw. I don't know what you saw. But he. I think I saw a guy who could play all over the interior D-line. They had him lined up on at edge. They had him lined up in the, in the B-gap. Um, at his size, he's not really a nose. He's somewhere between like a three-tech and a guy who could potentially play off, you know, on an edge. Uh, mm-hmm. on a tackle i mean but he gets a he get he's pretty explosive like you watch him off the snap he's explosive he he drives tackles and guards backwards and he has some nice moves he has some like dip and rip moves to get into the backfield like there, again admittedly there's not a ton i can find on him but what i found was very impressive and you know this is a guy who's probably going to be like a udfa um, yeah you know which is shocking when you look at his production number so is, are we looking at like the sleeper of the class here Dude, it's crazy, man. I I was I couldn't find any all twenty two. I'll probably eventually try to track down some other Virginia Tech defender and use that as a way to watch him in all twenty two. But you know, from the few like clips I could find him, he looked very explosive. I definitely want to dive in more to him, but it seems that way, man. He has crazy. I know he's a smaller guy, 
but he has crazy athleticism numbers. I mean, running a 487 at 286 pounds is extremely impressive. And I was like, you know, we saw that. That was reported on Twitter when we brought him in. And, you know, I messaged you. I'm like, yeah, that's, that's interesting. You're like, whatever. And then, I, right. you know, I, I pulled up that PFF numbers. I'm like, holy shit. <laughs> like, I'm like, the grades are great. The pass rush win rate is very good. He has only he, oh, he, he said 7.4 missed tackle percentage is extremely low. So he's reliable. Like I, I, I have to dive into this guy more because this really could be one of the sleepers of this draft, just based off his production and athletic profile. Um, and I'm, I couldn't be happier to see that the giants have shown interest in him because, um, you know, at the end of the day, if, if we grab him in the sixth round with, with like our last pick, uh, he, he could be one of the guys that I'm like most excited about on our out of our day three picks. I'm way more excited about him, you know, late than Mason Smith at pick 70, you know, or yeah. 100. I'll be honest, because I think you're, this is a swing for the fences guy. This is the kind of guy we talked about before when back when Darius Robinson wasn't a household name and we were talking about him. Mm-hmm. I, I, we said, like, that's the kind of guy we need. We need, like, a, a, a down 3-4 down lineman who's a defensive end type, you know, who can play with some versatility as a defensive end or as a three-tech, line up opposite guards, line up on tackles, but generate some power rushes, right, and, and have athleticism. Uh, and, you know, the prototype are guys who are not necessarily all 6'5", six, 6'6", six, six, maybe, like, this territory, like 6'2", six, 6'3", six, but guys who are, like, 275 to 290 pounds who can really, you know, really get drive on the interior and get pass rush from the inside to sit next to Dexter Lawrence. Darius Robinson is now being firmly comped as like a first round pick, if not a very early second round pick. This guy, I mean, yes, he's the draft. Right. Uh, <laughs> for Darius for Darius Pink, like viewed, I mean, I know there was some injury he had a t- I see DK already had a torn Achilles last year. Um, yep. Oh and, yeah, I did I did see that. But he still played this year and, and Achilles injuries heal quickly. So this guy's a he's a defensive end, really, and I think he could be a three tech. But I mean, listen, watch for this guy, Giants fans, because this is one to keep your eye on. Like when I started watching him and looking at his data, I was like, holy shit, who is this guy? I can't believe I missed him because I watch a ton of like these ACC games, um, you know, because I'm in the market. But yeah, Phil Darius Payne, uh, Phil Darius Payne is a guy to watch. Um, Kirkland Darius Robinson, that's what I would hey. say, you know. Uh, you could do worse. So I, I love this 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 guy right here as like a potential sleeper. Yeah, I'll definitely try to, you know, look up some more film and I'll, I'll post some click, clips on Twitter if I can find it, because he it, from what I saw, he did. He did look explosive. Yep. All, All right. right. Next guy. All right. Well, I got to also go ahead and lead off uh, your guy right here. A guy you've been pounding the table for since last year. Michael Penix Jr., you know, 6'2", 216 pounds, uh, you know, out of Washington. You know, one of the one of the best quarterbacks in college football this year, you know, went and played in the national championship in, you know, it had probably the game of his life in the semifinals versus Texas. And it's probably <laughs> one of, if not the best games that any player played in college football last year. He was absolutely on fire. You know, he's had his fair share of criticism. So probably not fair share. He's He's been overly criticized throughout this draft process. But, um, you know, we've gone through it a ton already. Uh, I'll give you, you know, one last shot to give uh, your pitch for, for Michael Penix, uh, Sal. But, uh, you know, he is definitely – I'll say this one last thing before I hand it off to you. To me, it's becoming very clear that the way the NFL sees this is that he is closer to the top four quarterbacks than he is to Bo Nix and Spencer Rattler. I know we keep hearing otherwise from the Benjamin Albrights and like that of the world, but while you see how these pro days are being done, when you look who the commanders brought in for theirs and Michael Penix was brought into this top four, the giants who they brought in and they didn't bring in, you know, Rattler and Nix until like, just like today, like, Nobody showed up to Nix's like pro uh, pro day and shit like that. Penix is getting the attention at least closer to these top four quarterbacks than those guys are. So I find that very interesting. But uh, you know, tell tell us about Michael Penix and your thoughts with him with the Giants. Sal. Uh, can't tell you guys anything I haven't been telling you for 
two years at this well one year of our the last seven months of our show and you know for those who know me for two years i mean um i've grown tired of arguing this point with most people and i think other people have been banging the drum loudly our buddies one tnd kit um to me this just comes down to what you believe and versus what you know what you want to what people want you to believe you you watch him on film and he's an elite passer there's no other way to put it he he's an advanced passer who understands and you know he understands defenses and he takes advantage of leverage he puts his receivers in a position to win and he has the arm talent and the arm strength to challenge every inch of the field and he uses it he's fearless he stands strong in the pocket he doesn't take sacks he has a 7.3 percent um he has 7.6 percent pressure to sack rate which was tied with bo nicks or best in the class um and he does that every single year it's not a fluke whereas bo nicks his number is tied to an average depth of target that's like less than half of what what Penix is is because he ran a very kind of simplified West Coast type offense in Oregon. No, no knock on him, but that's what they ran. It's short passing game. Uh, Penix stood in the pocket and did not take sacks and still produced down the field. He's a vertical passer. There are a lot of criticisms of him over the middle of the field. I think that's always been kind of bunkum. Matt Waldman agrees with me. It's bunkum. You watch him. He's pretty good over the middle of the field. He's pretty good under pressure. Is he perfect? No. Does he have footwork issues? Yes. Does he need coaching like these other kids? Absolutely. You know, there are some mechanical issues that have to be worked out, but he's already a very good player. His issue is his age and his injury history. And I think largely I feel like a lot of people assigned him a day two value based on those things, assuming that's where he would land because of age and injuries. And they've been working backwards and trying to make him a day two player on tape and on scouting because they they came to the conclusion first and are, are now trying to generate evidence to support the conclusion. And sadly, I think Dane Brugler is very, who I have a lot of respect for, but I think Dane Brugler has been the worst at this. He's been, he's been pounding the table. This guy's not nothing better than like a, you know, day mid day two type guy. And I'm getting a little tired and I like Brugler, but I'm getting a little tired of listening to him say this when there's very little evidence to back it up. He's kind of conjuring up mechanical issues that he doesn't conjure up for anybody else in the class. Um, I do think NFL coaches and NFL teams view this differently. I do think he's going in the first round. I do not believe he's going to get to the second round. I will say, though, if we pass on quarterback early, I'm praying that teams overthink this and that he slides. Mm -hmm. And he slides and he slides right to 47 or right to where the Giants can go get him if we decide to not take him in the first round. And I don't want this for this kid because I think he deserves better, but I want it for us. Um, So. I mean, that's that's all I'll say about him. You know, obviously, there's nothing else to say. You either believe in what you see or you don't. Um, listen, the injury history is real, and I think that's going to give some teams pause. And you can see him slide because of that. But as a player, he's outstanding. You and I have discussed this one last point. If, if Washington had lost the game to Texas, right? Because mm-hmm. he put on a C.J. Stroud-esque show against Texas. Against a good yep. team. Um, and he was facing a ton of interior pressure that game from Byron Murphy and, and Tavondre Sweat, and he was navigating it like a champ. If they lost that game, if if Quinn Ewers, you know, didn't have like a like a I don't know like a, a psychotic breakdown in the pocket all game, he was horrible that game. If he could have just completed a wide open pass into you know that corner route in the back of the end zone on the final play, um, and Texas ends up winning that game. And Washington's season ends on that note. As much as that's bad for the players on Washington, if Michael Penix's junior season ended not, you know, on that note, and with him actually scoring all game long and not being his fault, the way CJ Stroud season ended, I really feel like the discussion about Penix would be very different right now. If he never got to face that Michigan defense and Michigan defense, which was as close to a pro style defense as possible, which is people say is like a knock on Penix, but that they, they beat the shit out of everybody all year. You and I were predicting that from like the second week, like this team's going to kick everybody's ass. Like that's a well-coached team full of athletes. Um, if he never had to play that game and they just lost that game because Quinn Ewers sucked a little bit less. Um, I think you're hearing firm top 10 to 15 discussion of Michael Penix without any hesitation. Yeah. Um, so uh, just uh, anyway, that's the, that's the whole scoop. Yeah. I mean, you started to hear it after, after the text game, Brugler is like, Hey, if he does it again, like everybody after that one was, you know, literally when you look at these PFF numbers here on the screen, 93.5 in the Texas game, but then, you're able to totally discount it because he had a you know 49.9 versus Michigan and it went the complete other way. He got hurt. You know, it was it was not a good game for Michael Penix Jr. So um, you know, kind of 
ex- people kind of just explained away the Texas game. Look, as a Giants fan, I'm still, you know, I'm still hoping we get, you know, I have my eyes set personally on, you know, Drake May, JJ McCarthy. Those are the guys that I would, I would prefer there and try to go get. But, um, you know, I think if not, they'll probably go wide receiver. And I think if Michael Penix gets by the Raiders, that's the big question. I think the Raiders are the big question. And he very well might go there at 13. If he gets by the Raiders, I think you could start to see a fall for Michael Penix. I think yeah, at think some point. Seattle. You think about the yeah. Raiders in Seattle. Those are the two, mm-hmm. those are the two big uh, gauntlet yeah. hurdles he has to get through. It, and I'm less worried about Seattle since they got C- Sam Howell than I was previously, but it's still not, it's still, still possible. S- but Sam, yeah, Sam Howell's not holding up that decision if you want a first round quarterback. Yeah. I'm, I'm starting to think it's going to be a different Washington player in Troy Fontenu there. At Most 16. likely. Yeah. But, that, um, but, um, I do think if he starts to fall, I think you'll have to come back in the first round, trade 47, trade a second next year. Maybe you can call up your buddy Brandon Bean over at, at with the pick twenty eight. Come up, get Michael Penix Jr. and maybe you have Roma Dunze and, my, and Michael Penix team backed up back up in New York. And I would be very excited for that opportunity. And that would be a a hell of a consolation prize for missing out on uh, the top quarterbacks in this in this class. Yeah, I mean, I think if we don't get quarterback early for whatever reason, folks, like whatever it may be, the board plays out, the trades aren't there, whatever. I'm not going to go nuts. I mean, I won't like it, but at that point, immediately my attention turns to praying Penix gets through the gauntlet um, and hoping he does. And if he does, then I expect Joe Shane to go get him at that point. I mean, they gave him a lot of attention. Right. They have, they had him a full like workout. The, The whole organization went there to see him. It's very obvious he's the type of player you can win with at the NFL level with his playing style. And I know people will argue. They'll say, I've heard people say, oh, he's a college quarterback. I think that's all bullshit. Um, you know, there's nothing he's showing you on tape that says college quarterback. I'm sorry. He doesn't have a college arm. He doesn't have college understanding of defenses. He doesn't throw the ball with college leverage. He doesn't take co- college sacks. He's a pro. Uh, and I think he's a pretty good bet to be a decent pro. I think you put him on a team that knows how to use a vertical game, which, oh, by the way, Brian Dable happens to be one of those people. Uh, you have a speed threat in Jalen Hyatt. And theoretically, in this scenario, you've got Roma Dunze, right? <laughs> or Malik Neighbors. Mm-hmm. Um, you can start seeing it get put together. Anyway, I'll stop there. We'll see. We're a week away. We'll find out. Let's go on to the next guy. All righty. You're up. The All right. One. So uh, number 24 out of our 30 is Adiza Isaac. Edge rusher from Penn State, six foot four, two hundred forty-seven pounds, fifth-year senior. Out of, he's from Brooklyn. Uh, I think he. I don't know if he was an actor. I think this was a local visit and not a top thirty because he's yeah, from they, Brooklyn. They never confirmed which which it was. Um, yeah. So I just threw it in here. So I, I'm going to summarize it pretty quickly. I don't like Adisa Isaac. <laughs> I know T Kid likes him. So <laughs> I like, didn't either. <laughs> so I mean, what people like about Adisa Isaac is that there there are definitely like fast twitch motions at the snap. And he's an athlete, and I get that. It doesn't translate much on film in terms of pass rush winning, right? He's just, he's a good run. I think he's decent in the run game. I think he sets a, fir- a firm edge in, in a lot of places. Um, I don't think he's a good finisher. I don't think he he has like a closer's mentality as a pass rusher. And for all his athletic gifts, I don't see a guy who, I just like, there's, there's something missing there about him finishing as a closer, as a pass rusher. If you're looking for an edge to set the rush, I mean, to set the edge in the run game, that's fine. Am I taking that guy in the second round? No, not me personally. So I'm not a big fan. Maybe I'm wrong on this, but I feel like there's a lot left to develop in him. So I would, you know, I'm not high on taking him, you know, early to midday too. What about you? Yeah, I'm not super excited about him either. I don't like, you know, unlike a lot of these these Penn State guys, I mean, look, it's a guy who's six four and ran a, four seven four he's not the uh he's six four two forty seven and ran a four, uh, four seven four he's not this freak athlete that we've seen over and over again coming out of Penn State that's that's not this guy he is not a guy who had a a ton of production I mean look he has seven and a half sacks pr- pretty good but um nothing incredible I've you know I've heard a lot about you know he's a great teammate all that type of stuff that's great that's fantastic, but he's projected as a second or third round pick. Not for me. Not 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 interested in that range. If he's there day three, let's talk. Um, you know, it's a week 
edge class and you know maybe you can it's something i'd be interested just to add an edge but uh you know we made our addition at edge brian burns i'm not forcing anything like uh, yep. yeah uh, i agree i'm looking so. for developmental guy if you're gonna add an edge in this class look for look for a high upside of upside athletic like swing on day three give me give me like to me like give me mo camara a hundred times over a hundred out of a hundred over adiza isaacs yeah a hundred He's a Mo- developmental guy who's not that great of an athlete. Right. But Mo Camara is like, he's a mm-hmm. smaller guy, but he plays with his hair on fire. Right. Give me that guy who you could, at minimum, I know I bring in Mo Camara. You get him on day three and you bring him in for, for like NASCAR packages and just like, he's a monster. Right. He's going to blow up play. Give me that guy over the boring player in this situation that you have to spend high draft capital on. You already have three really good edge rushers. You don't need to spend a lot on on Isaacs, so that's kind of where I'm at on him. Um, that's 24. We got one more guy confirmed. Um, there are a couple more that came in today, but there's one confirmed yeah. guy, and I we would be remiss not to review him with one T paying attention here. So there, go for it, man. Yeah, Audrey Gestame. Um, you know, he's a guy I was really happy to see we brought in. You know, um, the only running back we brought in before that was Trey Benson, and Trey Benson's most likely going to cost you like a third round pick, which, you know, if there was a guy that we'd do it for, Trey Benson's probably the guy I'd want to do it for. But I would I think it's a deep running back class. Well, you know, it doesn't have like true bell cow studs, but it's got guys who are really good at what they do. And Audrey Gessamay is one of those guys. He is a guy who you can run between the tackles and is as good as it gets there. Yes, he didn't test as well as you'd hope. Um, you know, at the combine, he ran a 471. He ran a better time in his pro day, a 461, which is, you know, a lot easier to swallow than a 471. As much as I like Estime, that would was hard to just turn a, uh, turn an eye, a blind eye to, even though, like, I think, like, athletic testing is overrated for running backs. I think it's a lot more about instinct, vision, play style, and all that. But, you know, Audrey Gessme was one of the best running backs in all of college football this year. Um, you know, he, let's see, he ran for 1,341 yards, 6.4 yards per carry, and 18 receiving touchdowns. Yeah, and, you know, added 17 receptions for 142 yards. You know, receiving isn't his strong suit, but, like, you know, I've said this many times on the show, there's, got, there's can-do and cannot guys. You know, Waldman talks about a lot of, like, yes or no's as the valuations. I kind of see that with receiving at running backs. And he's a yes. He's a guy who can catch the football. Um, you know, he's a guy who averaged 4.27 yards after the catch. He's a guy who had uh, 64 missed tackles for us. Two things I look for a lot uh, when, when evaluating running backs. He He's a guy who I think would be a, a perfect complement to somebody like Devin Singletary. And really, it would be a good change of pace from what we've had in years past with a guy like Saquon Barkley, who is, yes, a very talented running back who at any time could break break a 60-yard run. But he's also a guy who negative one yard, one yard, negative two yards, 50 yards. Audrey Gassime is going to be two, three, six, three, four, six, like, he he's a guy who you just pound and will always fall forward, always get yards. Um, I'm a fan of Audrey Gestime, and he's a local kid, Nyack, New York. Um, what do you have, Sal? Yeah, uh, I've been a big critic of the Saquon Barkley type of player. Great home run hitter, obviously a talent, but they're not your quarterback's best friend. I keep hearing people say that, oh, you no, know, quarterback's best friend is Saquon Barkley. You know, he's your quarterback's worst enemy because he's consistently <laughs> putting him in third and long. Yeah. Um, and that's the problem with Saquon Barkley and runners like that who are always looking to try to hit home runs and refuse to, um, you know, to go ahead and, you know, just take the yards that the block, your 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 offensive linemen are giving him. Now, I'm not saying he had good offensive line play, but there were plenty of plays where he had, you know, he had zone blocking abilities to run forward and take the yard. He just didn't want it. He wanted to hit home run. That was his game. Um, and <laughs> see, fire kill. I'm not that tough on on take one. All things considered, that's fair. Um, I don't hate him, but uh, but I'm I'm glad he's gone. I'll be honest. Um, but no, I 
I, I, wa- I prefer running backs like Estime who will, will get you to third and short or help you avoid third down. That's the name of the game. In a passing league, you do want to control the ball. You want to run the ball well and have a balanced attack. But to me, running the ball well means getting your getting your team in third and manageable on a regular basis or avoiding third down and controlling you know the line of scrimmage. You need linemen who can do that, but you need runners who will trust their linemen. You need runners who will let blocks develop, follow the back of the helmet, take their gaps, plow forward for four or five yards, right? You're not going to hit a lot of home runs in the NFL because you're just, you know, you're not going to get around these athletes that often, you know, it's, it's, you can, and to some extent, but it's not, a, it's not a way of life that you want to endear yourself to. You want guys that guesstimate who are going to get you like those tough yards, you know, over the middle. You have a guy like Singletary, who's a good zone runner, who's going to take those yards and offers a little in the passing game. You have a guy like Gray, who's kind of similar, right? Like a little bit of a tough runner can be used in a passing game. Estime would be a very nice compliment to those guys. You know, Estime is that power back. I, and I think his testing, um, it actually helps us quite a bit because I can see teams overthinking this and letting him slide totally right, right into like, like fourth, fifth round territory. It's mm-hmm. certainly possible, right? And if you can grab an Audric Estime there, your running back room is is basically complete, at least for now, right? Yep. You got Estime, you got Gray, you got Singletary. That's a pretty stout combination of of runners that you can put behind a decent line are they elite no but they're solid they're going to get you those four or five yards of carry they're going to be thrust in the run game they can block well he's a good blocker uh he's good in pass pro so i like him i would love him i'm glad the giants decided to to use the top 30 on him because it tells me about the kind of running back they're looking for it it may be estimated maybe somebody like estimate but i like the thought process here so that's kind of where i am with him yeah, the one one other thing I'll add, he you know he's a guy who he only fumbled once all of last season. It was like I think it was on the first drive of their season. He didn't fumble for the rest of the season. Has zero drops in his entire career, so he doesn't put the ball on the ground. Uh, reliable player. Uh, yeah, like you said, I, would, I I agree. I think he's gonna get pushed down. You know, he's ranked ninety eighth on Brugler's board. I could easily see him available at one hundred seven, and maybe even in the fifth round. Yep, I agree. Are there a few? I mean, that's our list. That's up to, what was that, 24? Um, but 25. Uh, 25. Um, there are a few more guys. We, okay, so it's worth mentioning. I, I heard, I think Bo Nix and mm-hmm. Spencer Rattler both got top 30s, right? Um, yep. Very briefly, Bo Nix had another, he had an outstanding season in college. He's on most big boards, ranked right around the same territory as Michael Penix Jr., another guy who has been in college forever, has more starts than anybody in FBS history as a quarterback. Um, very efficient quarterback, very, very good field processor. Really quick going through his progressions, good processor. Um, understands his strengths and weaknesses very well. That's probably the most important thing about him. He's very mature out there in the sense that he knows what he can do very well and he knows what he cannot do. What he can do very well is work the middle of the field and work quick game like a master. And he really does that well, leads his, leads his receivers well with good accuracy in the short intermediate area, gets the ball out quickly, lets his playmakers make plays. Very Shanahan-esque in his style. Mm-hmm. What he doesn't do well is is drive the ball down the field with a lot of velocity, you know, take advantage of throws outside the numbers with consistency and, and uh, you know, good arm talent. It's just not his game. Um, so if you're asking him to run an offense where he has to stretch the field and use like kind of all nine segments of the field, that's not what he's going to do for you. He's going to be a surgeon in the middle of the field in the short intermediate area. You really need to run a West Coast system to maximize what he gives you. Um, if the Giants want to take Bo Nix, by all means, take him somewhere, but then adapt the offense to him. You know, mm-hmm. you can't run Brian Dable's Earhart Perkins nomenclature of a vertical offense with Bo Nix. That's a bad combination. But you can run a Shanahan offense. You can run a McVay offense with this guy. What, yeah. what are your thoughts on Bo Nix? No, I totally agree. With it. It's funny. You know, I think it started in this process where you and I were both talking about, like, what are people seeing with Bo Nix? Like, they're all hyping him. Nobody's talking about his – the people are hyping up his arm being big. Like, we don't see this. And you see all, like, a guy like, like Lance Zerline and other guys who were, like – I thought his arm was big and then I saw him in person and you know, it's, it was not strong. I'm like, I don't know how you guys didn't see that. 
tape because you're professional evaluators, but whatever. Um, but and it's funny, it's gone almost the opposite way for me at this point, where I feel like Bo Nix is catching a little too bit much too heat. much. Yeah, heat. yeah, because yeah. look, he's always been a limited player. Like, like he if you expect him to come and run a vertical offense, he's gonna fail. It's gonna that's what I think a lot of what he's well, his failures at Auburn was. It was not a good fit for his skill set. But he was one of the best quarterbacks in college football running that West Coast offense in uh, in Oregon. And I think if you, you know, put him in a quick hitting like like like, almost exactly what Miami did for Tua. If you do if you get a guy who can tailor an offense for what he does best and run a West Coast offense and quick hitters, um, you know, maybe, you know, the Giants case draft like a Malik neighbors and get the ball into his hands quickly, things like that. Then like, yeah, you can make it work. I just my thing is I don't love the idea of asking Brian Dable to like reinvent the wheel in an area that is not his strong suit. Um, I You know, I think. I think Mike Kafka would help a lot out with that. I think he would he would have to swallow his pride a little bit and let Mike Kafka kind of like, you know, because he comes from a West Coast offense with Andy Reid where he could really design a great offense. And, I'm you know, Brian Dable's a great mind. I'm sure he could design a very good offense, but it's just not his strong suit. Like, look, if they do it, if they draft Knicks in the second round, I don't I don't want to go, go up and get first. If you're going up, I want to go up and get Michael Penix. But if you know if you you missed out in your quarterback and you're like, I still want to take a shot at my guy, go ahead and get him. But just know what's coming with that. If you understand what's coming with that and understand the limitations, but I but like think you can still do it that and you do it, like I I I'm just going to have to trust that you can, because I do think he can be a quarterback in the right offense and it's up to our, our coaches to make it work. So, um, yeah, I like, I like, I like Nick's just, it's just, he's very scheme specific. I mean, I, there's a chance he goes in the first round. Um, there's a small chance that, you know, a couple of teams might look at him and say, he fits us. We need a quarterback. So you're, I'm, I'm talking the Denver, um, mm-hmm. maybe, Maybe the Raiders, you know, I can see that potentially, although I don't think he maybe, works in their system. Maybe, maybe Minnesota if they Minnesota. miss out. But yeah. I'll, I'll make a case for Miami here. I've made this point before. I think he's basically right-handed to a, um, in many ways. Elite processor, gets the ball out quickly, runs short game well, all the things you just elucidated. doesn't take sacks. Um, they have to decide what they're doing with Tua. I'm not paying to a $60 million. It, mm-hmm. I would just, I personally would just draft Bo Nix and keep it moving. I'm serious. I would, I might tag to a and trade to a, uh, and, but I'm not, if I'm them, they're, they're up against cap issues. They have, they want to retain their talent. I don't think I would reorganize my organization completely around Tua. I know you have a little different view on this, but I don't see a, ton of difference here in play style and i probably would would take bo nicks in the first or second and have him ready to take over for tua what about you yeah no i don't agree disagree with you at all actually i disagree with you a little bit on the dak prescott take with them but as far as miami goes i think they're so scheme based there and i think mike mcdaniels with their weapons yeah i think he would he would fit that offense like glove. Obviously, you know, Mike McDaniels would do what Mike McDaniel does and he would alter that offense and play to bone X's strengths because, you know, they're not the exact same player, but they, but they run a very similar type of offense in the sense of what they do best to their strengths. So um, I agree. I don't think they will do it, but um, I, I do think that would be better for team building, but at the same time, that was your plan. You don't let Christian uh, uh, Christian Wilkins and Robert Hunt walk with preparation to pay your quarterback. That's fair. Um, Spencer Rattler was another guy who got a, who got a, a top 30 visit. Um, he's probably QB. I think he is firmly QB seven in this yeah. class behind um, pretty safely behind Michael Penix Jr. And Bo Nix. Um, He's an interesting character in terms of prospect. I mean, he's been in college a long time. He's 24. He was once a top prospect of the country when he was recruited to Oklahoma by Lincoln Riley. Um, Started off well, and then he fell off, you know, and he lost his job to Caleb Williams. He's had issues leading the locker room and being kind of a bad seed when he was in Oklahoma. To his credit, he reorganized, went to South Carolina, rebuilt his image, rebuilt his game. Um, and I, I think you do get credit for those things. You know, he showed some resiliency in doing that. 
Mm-hmm. Um, so I'm not going to judge him on character and things like that. I will say that there are limitations to. So he has good arm talent. I I think people make his arm talent sound like it's elite. Like you're sitting on Patrick mm-hmm. Mahomes, he's not. Like he has a he has good arm talent. It's not elite yep. arm talent. Like he doesn't he doesn't touch the other guys at the top of the class. He doesn't have that kind of arm. Um, his big time throw rate is not great. You know, two point nine percent, and his turnover worthy play rate is 2.2 percent it's almost even you know like he, he almost makes as many throws that are turnover worthy as big time throws his issues are not physical they're all kind of here he makes bad decisions you know and i think a lot I, I still haven't seen him shake that yes he faces a lot of pressure he had bad o-line play but he still makes a lot of bad mistakes out there in the pocket and that's got to somehow get coached out of him to get something out of this guy so to me right now he's a backup quarterback in the nfl Ideally, I'm sticking with what we've said. He's a guy that needs to go to a team that has an established starter who's a really high end starter that he can learn from. A good quarterback coach. He needs to, he needs, I think you've mentioned the Tyrod Taylor trajectory. I like that, Mm -hmm. where he just sits for a few years, learns the NFL, coaches out bad habits, coaches in good habits. And then I can see him having, like, in his in year three, year four of his career, developing an opportunity to become a starter, you know, and a good starter in the NFL. Maybe not elite, but a solid starter. But I don't think there's a shortcut here for Spencer Rattler. I, I just don't see too many worlds in which he comes in and starts year one, year two, and becomes an established, like, quality NFL starter. What about you? Yeah, man. I I do I agree with you. I think people overhype uh his arm i i look don't get me wrong it's a very good arm it's an nfl starting arm like he does have like nfl starter arm which is you know rarer out of you know these some of these uh backup these later round picks but like it's good for the the being a quarterback seven in the class i'll say that but it's it's not it's not Caleb. It's not May. Like people are trying to make it out to be it's not just that he has the arm talent with like those guys, but he's just, you know, not quite there. It's, it's, it's not that I really don't think it's anywhere close to them. Um, And then my worry is this is a five-year college football player. He started for four years. Look, you know, when we talk about a guy like Michael Penix and we talk about a guy like Bo Nix, we like them because at this point in their career, they're two of the best quarterbacks in college football. Now I understand that Spencer Rattler had one of, if not the worst situations in college football this year, he had the worst offensive line in all of college football. And I don't think it was close, but at the same time, although I do think he grew ex- a lot from Oklahoma, I like, if you get what Spencer Rattler is in college in the NFL, I'm not happy with what I got there. Like I, I'm looking at what he's showing at a college level, similar to what he can get to at the NFL. I don't know if that's fair or not. Just like to, to where he stands compared to his peers about if he can get there compared to his peers. And I see maybe he can be like a top 25 quarterback if everything goes right. But, um, I, 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 I think he's a backup and maybe, maybe can find an opportunity down the road in the right situation to be a starter. The funny thing is if there's any guy in this class who could potentially like prove us completely wrong and we'll look back and say, you guys are out of your goddamn mind saying this, it it could be Rattler. Like he has intrinsic ability, right? And if if everything breaks right, he could become a very good starter. It's It's just, there's so many things have to break right for that, for me to believe that I just don't have a high degree of confidence. That's the way this is going to go. It's it's never the guys with the baby arm that make you look silly, and you know he he doesn't have a baby arm. Um, there's another guy like Joe Milton. Like although I you know I have all a, a ton of questions. I don't, I think he's gonna end up being a tight end in the NFL. He could he could if he figures it out, he can make me look really freaking dumb because he has the traits. <laughs> right. All right. Um. So that's those guys. There are a few other guys on the list. We'll go through. We're running a little long as per usual, but I don't care at this point. It's our last <laughs> episode before draft week. So these guys are worth mentioning. These are local pro day guys. And we can just blow right through them really quickly. So Max Melton is a quarterback from Rutgers. We've reviewed him before. Uh, we did. He was part of our, I think he was, he might've been my guy on the cornerback episode when we did it. Um, he was. Yeah. It, you know, played outside corner in college, played some nickel. I think projects nicely as a nickel corner. Um, technically very sound, very good tackler, good, good in run support can run with players. He can play off man. He can play press. He held his own against Ohio state receivers like Marvin Harrison and then Mac Buka 
has some issues at the catch point where he needs to turn his head better. And the, again, um, similar to some of the other guys where his technique has to work on. Um, that said, he came into the combine and went bananas and blew it up, which I was kind of shocked by because he, he looks good on film. He doesn't look like that. Um, yeah. But I think he put himself on the radar. He's a good player as it is. Um, he's being sort of viewed as, a, as like a solid mid-day two guy across the board now, isn't he? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, you have any thoughts on Melton? Yeah, man. I mean, I, he's going to get drafted high. Um, I still have my concerns about his play. Concerns that you know he, he seems to not know when the ball is there. He turn he turn he doesn't turn his head and doesn't have a good feel for like reading the wide receiver's hands to make a play in the ball. But he tested out of this world, so um, you know that's going to push him up and. Uh, he is a good football player. Maybe somebody who gets moved to the slot could be a really good football player. Um, you know, we're Max Mountain fans. Just I don't know how I feel about it. Go <laughs> second round. Yeah, I, I I would be comfortable at seventy with Max Mountain, though. I'll be honest. I think that's kind of where he's projected to go. Is sort of late second round, early third. I'm very comfortable taking a guy who looks like a starting corner on my team at seventy. Yeah, so, I agree. I, you can. You can never yeah. have enough good corners, and he's a great athlete, so I agree with you. Yep, and he's, again, he's already uh, very reliable in run support, which I think is a big deal for these guys. That's what gets them on the yeah. field. Like, like, like being a good tackler and being good in run support gets you on the field as a defensive back. It's the other stuff that gets you at a higher level. But if you cannot be trusted in run support, you're never seeing the field. And you've seen that with Cordell Flott. Like you got to get good at run support. So he's already good at that. So I, I think his, his floor is solid. Um, Theo Johnson, tight end from Penn State, another guy who blew up the combine. Insane testing, one of the best testers ever at tight end. Um, or was he the best ever? I can't remember. It was right up there. Yeah, um, it was up there. I don't remember. but Yeah, I mean, it, I think he's an intriguing prospect because of his athleticism. I think he shows a little bit of that on film. But I'll be honest, I don't see that athleticism on film. I think he's just kind of a good tight end. Nothing. I don't see anything spectacular in his game. Um, but again, he had Drew Aller throwing him the ball, so I don't know what that means. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, he he's one of those guys where when you're looking at tight ends, you look for these athletes. Um, he's not, I don't think he's anything special. I don't think this is a great tight end class. So, I mean, he could probably, he, he's, I would say he's a top five tight end in this class just based off his athleticism. I mean, he's, a decent player. He's not just a pure athlete. He's a he's a solid football player. So uh, yeah, I depending where he he is, I, I'm interested in him. Yeah, I think he's a good inline tight end. Like he's a guy that I th- I can see him carving out an NFL career mainly as a blocker, with some upside as a receiver. But I don't think he's a ton more than that. Honestly, not right now. Um, team his teammate is next chop robinson the edge rusher from penn state this was a local pro day so chop robinson you should know by now is one of the top edge rushers in this class blew up the combine yeah, that was i think expected we knew he would test off the charts and he did very very fast you know his game is speed 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 um some people are arguing that he has more than that to his pass rush game i don't believe it i think right now it's almost all speed there are a few spin moves here and there but nothing nothing consistent but what he does well, he does really well. So um, I think he's worked himself into the back of the first round. Um, I can see him there at the top of the second round. I'd be surprised if he got to 47. What about you? I, I'm i a big fan of Chop Robinson. You know, I've said it before that guys with his first step don't usually go as late as he's projected. Those guys go... You know, top, top 10. ten, top top ten, top yeah. ten. Look at a guy like Rashawn Gary. Rashawn Gary yeah. did not have great production in college, but he went high because he had an incredible first step and was a great athlete. He's bigger than Chop Robinson is, granted, but Chop Robinson is a guy that I feel, from an athletic standpoint, and still a very good football player. He's not just like a good athlete; he's a very good football player. That if you could get him, like. As a playoff team, I, w- I would sign up for that all day. Yeah, I would agree. I think he's, he's I think at his floor is sort of an elite pass rusher with speed. That's mm-hmm. his floor. Could he develop more of a pass rush game? I mean, he's only 21. 
you know yeah. and he's already a freak athlete he's like an alien athlete you know that's how he's been described we talk we call him the water boy with the way he plays with no yeah. gloves and go you know, ball see yeah. ball get ball right he's a freak out there so I, he, listen he if he got somehow to 47 it's hard to imagine he's not bpa at that point you know and then a lot of your other views have kind of have to you have to think about throwing them out the window so he's interesting um, next guy, Christian Mahogany off the guard from Boston College. A little bit of an undersized guard. I think he performed well at the Shrine Bowl. Um, mm-hmm. I don't love his tape. I, I I never did. I thought he was kind of weak. Um, what about you? I actually felt I do. I don't. I don't love his tape, but I actually kind of felt differently. I I liked his strength. I thought he was really good in the run game, and I I saw him bury some guys in multiple occasions. It's the pass game where I had my concerns. I felt he he has some technique serious technique issues that he needs to clean up um and you know he, you can see him you know really just look silly at, at times um he also has you know he tore his acl in 2022 that's something to look at but you know he's he's a guy who you know coaches are like they call him a tone setter he's a captain um you know we have connections there to boston college uh chris knee you know Close, you know, obviously a long time giant. He's up there and he's and he's working for them and he's worked a lot with Christian Mahogany. He speaks really high of him. So uh yeah, um definitely a fan. Probably I mean round if we got him like the hunt at like that we talk a lot of guys talking about the hundred ish pick, I'd I'd be happy. Yeah, that's fair. Javante Jean Baptiste, edge rusher from Notre Dame. Um, this is another guy who's getting sort of interest, but again, we're talking like fifth round ish, you know, fifth, sixth round in that territory. Uh, he's a 20, he's going to be 24 soon. Uh, six, four, 265, something like that. Um, this is another guy along, he's kind of a less athletic version of Adiza Isaacs, a very good edge setter, good in the run game. Uh, okay against the pass and pass rush doesn't have elite numbers there i think at about a 12 percent pass rush win rate which is good but it's not great you want these guys like approaching or above 20 percent for pass rushers at, as edge like chop robinson was around 21 percent um but as a, this is again a day three guy if you went for him who's going to be your, a rotational edge kind of like a boogie basham type you know he's mm-hmm. along that mold you know like a run stopper sets the edge nothing too spectacular just a solid player probably a special teams contributor any thoughts on him? Yeah, I mean, I didn't look too much into him. I'm more focused on the uh, pro day guys, but from just looking at like his stats and his PFF numbers and stuff like that, it looks like he's a well-rounded football player. Yeah, well coached. Um, mm-hmm. Let me see who's next. CJ Hansen. This one's interesting. Offensive lineman from Holy Cross. The, it's he's a guy who's been around for a while. Uh, so CJ Hansen is a guy who's been linked to the Giants multiple times, multiple times, specifically by those who follow by Art Stapleton. He keeps mentioning C.J. Hansen, that the, the Giants have, been, have had interest in him. He's 6'6", six, 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 305 pounds. He plays kind of every position on the interior. He's 23 years old. Um, nothing spectacular. This year he played almost exclusively. I think he's played only right guard his whole time, but he's projected to play, excuse me, as a, mm-hmm. as a versatile interior lineman. Um, he only allowed five hurries and three hits in – 695 snaps this year so that's not bad no sacks uh productive internal line but he's from holy cross from a smaller school there's some connection there with the giants i think it's through tim mcdonald i uh, could be mistaken but you know I, I i haven't seen his film to comment more than that how about you yeah i mean i haven't really looked too much into him i saw what you're talking about with um the fact that Art Stapleton has talked about him a good bit. Um, you know, you know, on top of only allowing one, uh, one or zero sacks this year, he's only allowed one sack in his entire five year career at Holy Cross. So, and obviously a smaller school, but something to keep in mind, you know, he's six, five, 300 pounds. He, you know, had a five second 40 yard dash, five second flat. So, you know, really solid, um, you know, this basically, I'll just give you this the summary of what Brugler said about him. He said, you know, overall, Hansen has functional movements and really focuses on the fundamental details position, but you'll need to get stronger to outlast defenders in the NFL. He he projects as a potential reserve on the interior, and he has him as a sixth and seventh round pick. Okay, that's reasonable. 
All right. Uh, just two more to go. Mo Kamara. I've mentioned him before. Muhammad Kamara, edge rusher at Colorado State. This guy I really like. I really like Mo Kamara. Um, he's kind of viewed as like a mid-day three guy on most consensus big boards. PFF has him as 139. I forgot where Brooklyn put him. I think he's right in that same territory. Um, because he's a little undersized, uh, he's he's undervalued. But this guy is a monster on the on the field. Like he really is a disruptive, explosive athlete. Um, his pass rush grade was 91.2 on PFF this year, and he had a pass rush win rate of 19.4. percent That's again, that's pushing that elite level. Still solid against a run, 72.2 uh, grade, but really he's a pass rusher, a speed pass rusher. If you can get a guy like him on day three, he kind of does what you're expecting Aziz Ojalari to do. You know, it's a guy who you don't, he can stop the run, but that's not his game. You use him as a pass rush specialist. So uh, Mo Kamara on day three, somebody to look for. What about you? Do you have any thoughts on Mo Kamara? Yeah, I mean, I'm with you. I think, you know, he's projected around five to six. I think he's, you know, for a class that kind of lacks a lot of depth at this edge class, he is a guy who excites me. You know, we tested well, you know, four, five, seven, uh, 40 yard dash is pretty solid for, you know, 250 pounds. Uh, you know, he is a shorter guy, but, you know, maybe you can look to be maybe like a Hassan Reddick type guy. And the guy, he's, you know, really athletic when you watch him. You know, he won Mountain West Defensive Player of the Year this year. He's you know, highly decorated and you know, I like I like guys who not only have that sack production for over multiple years, but also that tackle for loss production over multiple years. 16 tackles for loss in 2022, 17 in 2023, 8.5 sacks in 2022 and 13 in 2023. Just a really, really productive player, obviously at a at a you know smaller school. But, you know, as a guy, as a guy who plays with his hair on fire, he's never one of those. Yep. All right. We've come to our final players. What, what do we do? 25, 26, 7, 8, 9, 30, 1, 2, 3, like 35 guys, something like that of the top 30. I, mean, I don't know how we managed to do that. Yeah. Um, because we're, some of these guys are, are, are not, you know, they're not actually top 30. They're local visits. So, you know, take it for what it's worth. Um, our last guy is Matt Jones, offensive lineman from Ohio State. Um, so, I don't know much about Matt Jones. I really honestly did not get a chance to review his film. Um, I'm going to have to go back and see what the hubbub is about. But the Giants obviously spent some time with him. Uh, Monty, have you had a chance at all to review Matt Jones? I was lo- I was looking into him a little bit, but not a ton. I'll just get, I'll give you guys kind of a rundown from the freak list. Just give a, give an idea for all our listeners. Um, you know, he's six three and four eight, three hundred sixteen pounds. He has uh, reps at. Right, he has tw- 24 starts at right guard, six starts at left guard, one start at center. So he's a very versatile player. Um, you know, he didn't have incredible testing numbers, you know, 5 2 1 40, 28 vert jump, if anything, pretty bad ones, I would say. But, um, you know, this is what he uh, he had about him. He had, uh, Brugler had him priority free agent. He said, Matthew Jones grew up in Brooklyn, was a two, a two-way standout at Ermis Hall, a four-year starter at defensive tackle. He's recruited on defense by some power, power five schools. He signed with Ohio State as an offensive lineman. After backing up Jonah Jackson and filling in the sixth offensive lineman, he combined for 25 s- game uh, starts over his final two season and showed versatility. At center, Jones has good size, slide quickness, and short pull range, although his recovery movements aren't as controlled, stem from inconsistent hand placement. He can be walked back by powerful nose guards and is more of a body blocker, struggling to generate movement. Overall, Jones has inconsistent. Uh, inconsistent sustained skills because of his average balance and core strength. He offers functional movements uh, to earn his way onto a roster in the right situation. All right, there you go. I think that's it. We have done our top 30 list. Um, all the guys to look for. I think, you know, just recapping it quickly, there's a lot of guys you know, but there's some of these guys we just mentioned are a little bit less known. Pay attention to them. I was looking for themes. One of the two themes I got here um, that are worth taking home, I think. Um, one is in the defensive back world. They seem to be targeting guys who are who are versatile, who can play inside, outside, slot, and outside, you know, and outside, boundary corner, who a lot of these guys are really good in zone and in off-man concepts, which does make sense with Shane Bowen, but I think you're looking for guys like that, and they are all guys who are already somewhat reliable in the run game. 
Uh, that seems to be the theme I, I'm seeing in the defensive line. I'm seeing the theme of guys who are really good athletes who can one gap, right, and be three techs mm-hmm. who can pass rush. And I think that again makes sense because Bowen is going to want his front four to get there. So you're seeing some themes here. I like the fact that they're mixing in guys who could go early day two all the way down to like UDFA. I like the fact that they're putting that that kind of list together. I appreciate the process. Do you have any take home thoughts from this before we close it out? Uh, the only thing I'll add is I also think they added they're looking for versatility in the offensive line. Like even like a Cooper BB, like although we don't see him as the most versatile player in the NFL, is a guy who you know he's played right tackle, he's played both guard spots for Kansas State. So you know, and and they didn't bring in a guy like Christian Haynes, who we're a big fan of, but he's been a right guard purely. I mean. Jordan Morgan is a left tackle purely, but people see him as playing guard in the NFL. So it seems like us, uh, they really valued versatility with the offensive line as well. That seems to be the theme of this class so far, right? Looking for versatility, mm-hmm. which I appreciate. I think that gives you roster flexibility. But And folks, quarterbacks. And, quarter- <laughs> <laughs> and quarterbacks, that too. We'll, we'll, we'll see how that shakes out on draft night. But listen... Thank you all of you for sticking with through this. This is our longest episode. We keep setting records. It's amazing. Two and a half <laughs> hours. Um, but we had to go through 30 some odd players. So, so bear, you know, we appreciate you guys staying with us. This is our last episode bef- uh, before uh, our final draft preview. We will try to have something. I hope. Are we, you think we're going to be able to do that? I think so. On when, yeah. Maybe Wednesday uh, Wednesday. Yeah, I think we'll try to do something Wednesday. Before so, Mark, we if you're if you're interested, mark it down on your calendar. We're going to try to do something Wednesday night. I know a lot of you are asking for us to do a live draft stream. Uh, I'm not sure we're going to be able to pull that one off, but we'll talk about it. Um, but yeah. we're definitely going to have something for you guys on Wednesday night as a preview for the draft. Um, only eight days to go, so buckle up. It's going to be a rough eight days until we get there. But we've, <laughs> we've done a lot of work to get here to, to be able to analyze. So thank you guys for being with us. Uh, closing remarks, follow us. Follow at He's a Giant Pod. Follow Monty at, at Monte Cristo, M-O-N-T-E-C-R-I-5-T-O, or as El Jefe said, at Monte Crif, Ma, Monte Crif 5 2 uh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. uh, You can follow me at Queens underscore guy. Uh, we appreciate you guys. Thank you. We'll see you next week. Go Giants. Go Giants.